I'd like to welcome to uh, this afternoon's council meeting. I'm going to start with uh, land acknowledgement. We're meeting on the lands that have been home to Indigenous nations since time immemorial. We acknowledge that we are on the treaty lands and territory of Mississauga of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee. With increasing encroachment by non-Indigenous settlers in the area now known as Township of Sandra Wellington, the Mississaugas could not continue their traditional lifestyle and retreat to villages along the Credit River, eventually settling in the Grand River Valley. The Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation uphold their treaty rights within our jurisdiction. Today, the Township of Centre Wellington remains home to Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to share and respect Mother Earth and are committed to building constructive and cooperative relationships with Indigenous nations. Okay, uh, item number three, addendums and corrections to the agenda. We have none. Thank you. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary <coughs> interest under the Municipal Conflict of uh, Interest Act. Seeing none. Uh, presentations and announcements. And we're going to start, where it, start with item 5.1, Community Improvement Plan and Luciano. Uh, is Luciano, ah, yes, here we are. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm pleased to be here today. Um, my name is Luciano Piccioni. I'm the President of RCI Consulting, and my firm has specialized in community improvement plans and community improvement plan updates for well over 20 years now. Uh, in that time, uh, I have personally prepared uh, 50, around 50 community improvement plans, with several of those being updates of existing community improvement plans, which is the case, of course, with the Township of Center Wellington Urban Center Community Improvement Plan, or CIP as we like to refer to them. Um, so <clears throat> I'm currently working on this update uh, on the township CIP, as well as at the same time working on the update of the county's uh, community improvement pr programs, which are known as the Invest Well programs. And one of the reasons I'm working on both of them at the same time is to try and ensure better coordination between the township and the county community improvement programs. And we've already put in place some changes uh, to help do that. Uh, I've been working very closely with a staff project team that's made up of senior township staff uh, and senior county staff. Now that includes uh, Brett Salmon, the Managing Director of Planning and Development, and George Borovilas, the Manager of Economic Development. Uh, it's been great working with your staff. They're very accessible, um, great at providing feedback. So the process has gone very smoothly uh, to date. We've met several times as a group, and the purpose of today really is to update you on our progress, to obtain your input and answer any of your questions. So the agenda for the presentation, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, but we do have quite a bit of information to cover. Uh, for those of you who are not uh, perhaps that familiar with community improvement plans, I'll quickly um, give you a little familiarization uh, on what they are and what they can and cannot do. Uh, we'll talk about the purpose of the review of the township CIP. We'll take a quick look at the current community improvement project area and center programs, review the findings to date, and then present you with the draft community improvement goals, community improvement project area, and draft and center programs that are being proposed at this time for inclusion in the draft CIP, and then talk about next steps. Um, and I will highlight this more, but there will be a at least one more opportunity for council uh, to provide input and that will be at the statutory uh, public meeting and we're also planning to have a stakeholder and public meeting uh, within the next month or so after council has provided its input uh, to get input of course and feedback from uh, the stakeholders and the public so what is a community improvement plan well really it's nothing more than a planning and economic development framework that can be used to guide revitalization, redevelopment, and improvements within a defined area of need. Uh, it's enabled by Section 28 of the Planning Act, 
And normally section 106 of the municipal act prohibits municipalities from bonusing or providing any kind of financial assistance to any commercial enterprise, such as a grant or a loan or guaranteeing of a loan, anything like that is prohibited unless, there's an exception, unless you use section 28 of the planning act by preparing and adopting a community improvement plan. Now, once a municipality does that, the municipality can then prepare land for community improvement it can provide grants and loans to owners, tenants, and assignees for improvements to their land and buildings for development, redevelopment, construction, and reconstruction. Okay, So it's really important that your CIP establish the municipality's ability to do that in the proper way, and that it's clear, and that all of the potential applicants understand what they're eligible for and what they're not eligible for. In that regard, the CIP is really an enabling plan. Now what that means is that once it's been adopted and approved by a municipal council, it allows the municipal council to offer incentives, but it does not obligate the municipal council to offer those incentives. So if there's six incentives in the CIP, the municipality can choose to actually implement one, two, all, or none of those incentives. So it's just an enabling tool. Uh, it does not obligate the municipality to do anything. What I like about community improvement plans is rather than throw money at the problem, what they do is use public sector investment to leverage private sector investment to address the problem. Okay, um, History has shown us, because these plans have been in place in Ontario for uh, around the last 20 years or so, that they can over time produce significant results, but they are a long-term strategy. They're not a quick fix. And they should also be monitored and periodically reviewed and updated just as the township is doing with its CIP right now. Now, I want to be clear, because there is sometimes some confusion on this, what a CIP cannot be used for is to provide grants and loans just to attract a business to an area if that does not involve building or property improvement. It cannot be used to provide grants or loans to businesses for operational expenses, and it cannot be used to directly enforce property standards. However, it can be used in an indirect manner to uh, enforce property standards and even collect tax arrears as a requirement if, a, if an individual or business wants to apply for one of the programs. And we typically build those sorts of requirements into the CIP, and we've certainly built it into to yours. Now, the current CIP was adopted in 2015, so it is about eight years old. It's, it's dated, and it's in need of review and update. Also, a number of issues and gaps have been identified by, um, by the, the uh, staff project team uh, with respect to the current programs, and several guiding policies have also changed since 2015, including you know, things like the strategic plan, the economic development uh, strategic action plan, uh, the county's attainable housing strategy, and change uh, climate change mitigation plan. So what has happened since this plan was prepared and adopted is that certain key issues have emerged as being more important than they used to be. And that includes rental housing and supply, including affordability, uh, value-added agricultural uh, and agribusiness uses, sustainable building design, and environmental sustainability overall are some of the key issues that have emerged. So what we did was um, you know we took a good look at the township CIP and the county invest well programs um, and we reviewed the key policy and planning framework and the changes we conducted a best practices review of emerging and innovative programs being used by other municipalities to address some of those emerging uh, policy issues we reviewed the uptake and results of the existing programs and I'll speak briefly about that uh, I personally toured with staff existing and potential community improvement project areas uh, we reviewed the uh, key community improvement needs in, in all of the, the project areas, uh, the goals and the program gaps. And from all of that, we developed revised draft CIP goals, uh, CIP boundary, and incentive programs. So again, the purpose of today is to provide you with an update on that and get your feedback. And again, as I mentioned, the next step will be a stakeholder uh, public meeting after um, we've incorporated council's feedback. So in terms of the current community improvement project area, um, it, it's covered by five areas that are designated in the township official plan, and you can see them here. The downtown areas are Ferguson, Alora, Salem, highway commercial areas, existing industrial areas, mixed use areas, and residential transition areas. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we broaden that out in a moment. In terms of the current incentive programs, there are six programs. 
Three of them are in level one, and level one programs, <clears throat> excuse me, have delegated staff approval. These are the more minor programs, if you will. However, there is a restriction in the CIP that an applicant can receive only one of these level one programs. So you have the facade building and property improvement grant slash loan. This uh, program provides a, a grant and or loan of 50% of the eligible cost to a maximum grant and or loan of, uh, sorry, grant or loan of 10,000. Uh, that gets bumped up to 12,000 if there are multiple storefronts or it's a high visibility building or there are heritage features. Now, what I will note about that is it's, again, it's a grant or a loan. So you could get 5,000 grant, 5,000 loan. Um, the housing rehabilitation and conversion grant loan works in the same way. It's 50% of eligible costs uh, to rehabilitate or convert vacant space uh, to residential units, and it's a maximum of 4,000 per unit and a maximum of two units. Now, based on best practices, that's quite low, and it's not going to really get you to add a unit or two units to vacant space above uh, commercial ground floor, for example. And then we have the contamination study grant, which equals 50% of eligible study costs to a maximum of 10,000. Now, turning to the level two programs, these require council approval, okay? Um, these apply only to priority sites as identified by council. There's a list of those. Again, the applicant can receive only one of these and if they receive one of these, they cannot apply for a level one program. So the real problem here is that these programs aren't stackable, which makes for an incomplete package. All right, so really the incentive program package contained in a community improvement plan should work for small projects, it should work for large projects, and it should work for projects of different types. And unfortunately, these restrictions don't present a package that does that. So the tax increment equivalent grant would provide a grant, annual grant for 10 years equal to 80% of the township property tax increase. Um, that's only available for substantial projects, so major projects. There's a Brownfield Financial Tax Assistance Program that provides a township and education tax cancellation for up to three years on a site while it's being remediated. And then a bigger facade building and property improvement grant loan program with a maximum of 15,000 um, is also available. So let's look at what's happened with these programs. So the uptake of the level one, the smaller facade building and property improvement grant loan program has been very good. And it's helped fund numerous facade improvements and even a few, the facades on a few new builds in Ferguson and Alora. 36 applications have been received to date um, in total. Uh, that's generated $365,000 in grant funding and $143,000 in loan funding. The uptake of the housing rehabilitation and conversion program has been modest. So a, most of those 36 applications have in fact been the facade building and property improvement. And the uptake of the other level one and two programs, the housing rehabilitation conversion and the tax increment grant has been quite low. So what we've done with the revisions is try to improve that and generate more substantial projects. So key findings of the review. <clears throat> so the, the current goals uh, need to be updated because they do not fully address recent policy directions and emerging needs. Uh, the com community improvement project area needs to be expanded again to address emerging needs. Um, the current CIP programs, and this struck me when I first read the CIP, are they're confusing for applicants. It's not an easy document to navigate with this level one, level two distinction. The eligibility, eligibility criteria are not well defined and explained, and we're, we've already fixed that. Um, the prohibition on the stacking of the programs, as I mentioned, is a big disadvantage and does not reflect best practices elsewhere. elsewhere. Okay. Um, so overall, the current programs need to be updated. The administration of the programs should also be clearer. And again, we've revised the section, already done that, on administration that will go in the new CIP. And the coordination between the township and the county programs should be enhanced. So we've already made some steps to do that. One is um, sort of an early notice to county staff, even when there's uh, not necessarily an application received, but even an inquiry. So it gets it on their radar screen. And then as soon as an application is received, rather than it going through the whole process and then going to the county for participatory funding, the township staff will let county staff know immediately when an application is received. Okay, so that should help clean up a lot of the, the issues that we've seen in the past. So in terms of the, um, I think I skipped a slide here, sorry. 
In terms of the goals, the draft committee improvement goals, you can see them here. But what I will note is that goals three, four, five, and six, so housing supply, economic growth, and diversification, agriculture and agribusiness uses, and design and environmental sustainability are new. So four of the six goals are new. Um, we still captured most of the previous goals, but again, this reflects the shift uh, in priorities based on policy and based on emerging needs. We looked at the current community improvement project area, um, and based on, again, community improvement needs, the new goals, it needs to be expanded. And in order to take full advantage of the county programs, it needs to be expanded because they're offering programs in some of these other areas, like even the rural areas, for example. Okay. Um, so what we've done is we've gone from five sub areas to nine where incentive programs can be offered. However, we've strategically targeted the programs in certain areas to make them logical, consistent, and again, to try and just target the types of development that reflect those goals, the updated goals in the community improvement plan. So here are the nine sub areas. Um, so the new sub areas would be five, uh, the residential areas, and then areas seven to nine, which would be prime agricultural, the rural empl employment area, and hamlet areas. But again, as you will see in the next, in, in the table I'm about to show you uh, in a minute or two, um, the de permitted development in those areas, of course it would have to conform to the official plan and zoning bylaw. That's a given, and that's one of the requirements in all, or for all of the programs. But secondly, it only applies to certain types of uses. <clears throat> so, um, we've prepared uh, enhanced general program requirements to um, better protect the township planning financial and legal interests in the CIP. We've cleared up the eligible costs and requirements that are specific to each program. Um, we've expanded the types of programs and in some cases the maximum grant amounts, um, but they're more targeted. The stacking of programs is now allowed um, in certain situations. We clarified the program administration process and a monitoring program and a marketing plan. Um, they're in there, but we're going to update those again as part of the, the final document. So what do the new programs look like, what we're proposing? And again, this is draft. So there's a study grant program, which is equal to 50% of the cost of a, a range of studies. We've opened up the types of studies because it was realized that um, there's some different types of studies that uh, you know, ranging from environmental site assessments to design drawings to archeological assessments. So we've opened that up and we've increased, increased the maximum grant amount a bit. On the facade and property improvement, what we've done is sort of gotten rid of this grant loan distinction. It's a lot easier to just administer a grant. So that will be 50% of the cost uh, to a maximum grant of 10,000 and a bump up of tw to 12,500 for wider buildings, buildings with multiple storefronts, uh, high visibility and heritage. Then a separate building improvement loan program. So this would deal more with um, elements other than facade. This would deal with structural HVAC, those sorts of things. Again, 50% of the cost of the improvements to a maximum loan of 10,000. 12,500 for heritage or priority site. Now here's the new program, uh, there's several new programs, but here's a major one. The rental housing grant program. So this would be a grant equal to 50% of the cost of renovating existing residential, or residential units to code to make sure that they're more easily rentable or constructing new rental units to a maximum grant of 15,000 per unit and a maximum of two units. For properties in the CBDs, the highway commercial, uh, areas or the priority sites, a maximum of four units would be eligible because that's where you really want to get this rental housing. Okay. The tax increment grant program, <clears throat> that doesn't change that much, 80% for 10 years, but it's only for substantial projects and we are working on the definition of that to make sure that if you're going to use that program, it's got to be a significant project. And then the final program, and we, we sort of got interrupted on this one, we had come up with a really neat uh, rental housing DC deferral program uh, where um, affordable uh, rental residential units, and again, it has to be affordable rental, um, would not pay their DCs uh, in full for 21 years. Um, the units would have to be maintained as affordable in the agreement with the township for a minimum of 20 years. Um, there are a few definitions of affordable out there floating around, especially since the recent B Bill 23 amendments, but 
the township can use whatever definition of affordable it wants. Um, the provincial policy statement definition is <clears throat> the least expensive a unit for which rent does not exceed 30% of gross annual household income for low and moderate income households or where rent is at or below the average market rent of a unit in the regional market area. So we had this program all ready to go and then Bill 23 was passed. And the, there's an exemption in Bill 23 from development charges for affordable units. So this program is not required. However, um, the Bill 23 um, exemption defines affordable as a unit where the rent is no greater than 80% of their mark, average market rent. So it's more strict. And the township can use that if it wants uh, in this program. The reason we're going to leave this program is in the Community Improvement Plan is that if the province ever does away with its program, you'll still have something to promote rental, uh, rental housing, okay? Uh, affordable rental housing. So um, that's something we're going to sort of, you know, refine a little bit more, but we're pretty close on that. So as I mentioned earlier, here's a table that shows um, down the left-hand side, left column, the incentive programs, and across the top, the sub areas where they would be available. And again, you can see here that in primary agricultural areas and rural employment areas, um, there's only a few programs available. It's very targeted. Okay, this table will appear in the community improvement plan, uh, again, to provide clarity to potential applicants. And finally, the next steps. So again, I'm here to answer questions, receive input. Um, we will revise the draft programs uh, as necessary based on your input and comments. We will then uh, be holding a stakeholder and public consultation meeting, I'm hoping next month. And then we will take all of the comments and the input received there and prepare a draft final community improvement plan. That has to be circulated to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing and other prescribed agencies for comment. Once we have those comments, we'll revise the uh, CIP as necessary, and then there will be a Statutory Planning Act public meeting. Um, and again, this is another opportunity for council, the public, and key stakeholders to provide input. And if any changes need to be made, we will. And then the final CIP is presented to council for consideration uh, in the form of a final CIP and an adopting bylaw. And then once council adopts that bylaw and the 20-day appeal period expires, the plan uh, is in place and in effect. Again, however, it'll be up to council to decide which programs you want to implement. That's my presentation. I thank you for your patience. It, as I said, it was a lot of information to get through, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Luciano. Um, yes, comments, questions? Yes, Councillor Wilton. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting. I have a question about the table on slide 17. I'm just curious about the facade and property improvement grant, why you would not include prime agriculture and rural employment in that program. For which program? Sorry? With the facade and property improvement grant? One yeah, we evaluated that and the the problem with that is we felt that, that should those improvements should really be focused in the hamlets because it's really designed for commercial, like commercial, small commercial businesses. So I would suggest that there are with the on farm diversified uses and the rise in agritourism and some of those opportunities, there are some really interesting opportunities for agriculture to be uh, having some good economic activity for the community and for tourism as well. So I would suggest maybe having another look at that. And I think Norfolk and Haldimand have implemented some pretty good CIP programs in the agriculture sector. Okay, certainly we'll do that. Great, thank, thank you. you. Any other comments, questions from Council? Yes, go ahead, Council McDonald. Through you, Mayor Waters. Um, so it seems like we've got a lot of discussion to do as Council, so I guess, um, uh, where do we go forward from here with the discussions on how we want this to look as a representative of Centre Wellington? And um, so that's my first question. And the second question is, um, I've been to some hamlets in the area and uh, I'm glad they're included, but um, uh, I agree we need to extend this further into the rural communities that do have on-site stores and businesses that, that could utilize this. Yes, uh, Councillor Jefferson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, for the rental housing grant program, is there any distinction? I asked him a question. He oh, sorry. I, I didn't completely understand that first question. I'm sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor. 
Sorry, the first question was, um, what is the next step? So you're going to have a statutory public meeting. It's going to go in front of the Ministry of Municipalities. Um, for us, is this part of our strategic planning, or are we going to have separate conversations about this? So what we're going to do is take all of the comments today and revise the programs, and then we will take a similar PowerPoint presentation like this back out to a public meeting um, that we're targeting for next month. Okay, And of course, council members are welcome to attend that public meeting, and I encourage it. Right, because then you can hear what your community is saying, what your business people are saying. We will then take all of those comments and then prepare a draft community improvement plan, which has to be uh, circulated for comment to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. We'll get their comments back and other prescribed agencies, but typically it's just the ministry that comments. And we'll again refine it, revise it, and then that draft final plan will come back before council at a statutory public meeting where you'll be able to, again, say, we'd like this changed or we'd like that changed. So you have, you know, the public has an opportunity to comment next month, and you will have an opportunity to, come to comment again and provide input and direction to myself and staff in a few months when this comes back to you. Sorry, Councillor McDonald. Uh, yes, Councillor Jefferson. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Um, with the rental housing grant program, is there any distinction in there for long-term rentals or short-term rentals? Um, the requirement would be that, uh, again, keep in mind that that program is overridden by Bill 23. But if Bill 23 goes away, or and the interesting thing is they have not yet passed those regulations to implement um, the affordable development charge exemption in Bill 23. They will be coming. So in the meantime, if this is passed or that bill, that aspect of the bill is rescinded or, or changed in the future, the requirement that we're recommending is that the applicant would have to enter into an agreement with the township where they say they are going to keep that unit affordable, the rent on that unit affordable for 20 years. Okay. Oh, okay. And they will have to provide a report to the township every year in terms of what they're renting it for and how that conforms to the definition the township has used for affordable. I think you're discussing item six, the affordable yes. rental housing. I was meaning the rental housing grant program. That's item four. Ah, uh, okay. That's above. Yep. Okay. So, yes, this is the rental housing. It's not affordable rental housing. Okay. I so, meant so you're saying is this, uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor, is this short term or long term? Is there any distinction that allows either short term or long term or both within that grant program? No, the idea there would be that this is for a long term permanent conversion of vacant commercial space or excess space or the construction of new units to rental. So again, there would be a requirement here that it be maintained as rental for a set period of time but as long-term rental 20 years that's what i would recommend yeah okay so all of those same stipulations like the 20 years and the township has to be in on that then that's going to be included yes that'll be part of an agreement a legal agreement between the mm -hmm. applicant successful applicant in the township and typically when it's something like this that agreement gets registered on title so anyone buying the building would know if they're buying the building in say year 10 they know you've got to keep those units as rental for another 10 years minimum. Okay, so then if that also applies to our new added residential, like we included residential as a new item, uh, I think it was number, is it number five to be included um, under mixed use, industrial, highway, commercial, and residential, and now we are allowed to have up to three units on the same property and two of them can be rental, that's applicable for that as well? And would that have to maintain like your long-term rental? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Alrighty. Hmm. And just a second question, if I may. Um, there was discussion um, with our ec economic development committee over the years about signage and a portion of our facade being broken out into a smaller grant that would allow for signage or blade signs and things like that so that there would be a smaller grant available. Would that be available in this facade, CIP? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> We've broadened out a lot of the eligible costs 
in the facade and property improvement. In fact, that's why we renamed it facade and property improvement. <clears throat> so there'd be a, a wider range of signs as long as it meets the township sign bylaw. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Councillor Wilton. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Waters. Uh, just another question on Program Four, the Rental Housing Grant Program. I'm just curious if the second sentence there for properties and CBDs, highway, commercial, or priority sites is a maximum of four units, is really necessary. I'm just thinking that we really do want rental housing available throughout the community, and it's good to have a mix of housing in all sorts of neighborhoods. So I'm just curious if we can just scratch that and have it up to four units, no matter where you are, or change that a little bit. So. Yeah, so the, the rationale behind that, and obviously if that's the direction from council, I'm happy to do it, but the rationale behind that is that there's really two types of um, rental housing units. There's the one that was just mentioned where you're just adding a unit within an existing house or you know um, a granny suite, for example, in the backyard, that type of thing, because that's all, you know, it's all as of right now. And also where you're adding one or two units above commercial at grade in a two-story or three-story mixed-use building. Then there's new builds, right? So you could have somebody who's building a condo building with 20, 30, 40 units. So the, the four was really designed to cap that um, to limit the financial exposure. The two was designed for the other types. However, if, you know, again, it will potentially cost more money, but if that's a priority of council and you want it to just be for maximum of four units across the board, that's, that's fine. This is really designed to, um, you know, somebody who's building a new building and is doing 30, 40, 50 units is not going to be particularly swayed to do four rental units if their intent is condo. However, someone who's converting excess space above commercial uh, in a building, a mixed-use, small mixed-use building, they may be motivated to do that. So, again, typically in that situation, you don't see the addition of more than two units because it's just a space constraint. But we can certainly change it to four, so, yeah. Not a problem. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Luciana, for your presentation. I'm happy to uh, see that uh, we've expanded geographically the uh, program. Um, I think it's important that uh, it reflects uh, uh, the values of all of our communities, uh, or all areas within our communities, and especially those smaller parts of our communities, which are very important. But uh, we like the, uh, we, we definitely want to feel that they're definitely part of uh, the same opportunities that we have throughout. Uh, throughout our community as well. Anyways, thank you for your presentation, uh, and we look forward to this process as it moves along. All right, thank you all. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to uh, item uh, 5.2, uh, James Scott, re regarding uh, disc golf. Is uh, James, ah, James, welcome. My name's uh, James Scott. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm the owner of Allura Paddle Company downtown, so the canoe rentals, and also Move Center Wellington. So we do um, sports and movement opportunities for adults and, and kids in the neighborhood. Um, but for this, I'm just a community member um, advocating for uh, disc golf in Center Wellington. Um, so just by show of hands, has anyone here played disc golf? Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Has anyone, have you guys heard of it? Has anyone else heard of it? So for anyone that doesn't know, uh, disc golf is very similar to golf. Um, instead of a club and a ball, you have a disc. They're different than frisbees. There's drivers and putters and mid-range. It gets uh, complex if you wanted to. Uh, instead of a hole, there's a basket, just like that image. So you hit the chains, it falls in. It's a very booming sport ever since, especially the pandemic, um, just because it was good for social distancing and being outside. So there's 14,000 courses now uh, worldwide. Uh, last year, 4.3 courses on average were installed every day around the world, and 90% of courses are free to play, which makes it a pretty unique sport. So today I'm here um, asking for Parks and Rec staff to um, explore the feasibility of adding in a nine-hole pocket-sized course, um, probably at the CW Community Sportsplex, because that's where we have the most uh, space, and there's some space that's not uh, particularly used um, every season. So pocket size is good um, because it in encourages beginners to come out 
of all ages, and I'll explain that more. So yeah, why disc golf? Um, like I said, small course is accessible to all ages. I play with my grandpa who's 90 years old, and you can also have kids as young as five and six out there playing. Um, it's equitable. You just need one disc to start playing, which costs $10. Most courses are free to play, so pretty much everyone in CW would be able to play if they wanted to. And then there's also impact on the township, positive impact. Um, disc golf tourism is becoming a huge thing. Um, people like collecting courses. There's a UDisc app, so it has every course in the world. You can click, you can see the reviews, um, the ratings, and all that stuff. So I personally have traveled, like I drove two hours across the desert in Mexico just to go to a course, and a lot of people are doing that now. Um, and then also for the community benefit, just it's a place for people to socialize, get outside, and move their bodies, so that's just good for overall health. Um, more on impact. Um, for a nine-hole course, you can have up to 36 people using um, a course every hour. If you compare that to tennis, tennis you can only have four people utilizing a court per hour, and it's a fraction of the cost. So a tennis court usually starts at like $100,000 to install from scratch. Um, you could probably put in a nine-hole disc golf course for 10000 and you get nine times as many people using it. Um, and then also, yeah, again, disc golf tourism. 87% of U-Disc players traveled at least 32 kilometers for a round in 2022. A cool study happened in uh, between Sweden and Finland. There's an archipelago of islands, and they decided a few years to, a few years ago to go all in on disc golf. So they built 16 courses um, in a span of a year. They spent $250,000, and in the first year, um, increased the economy, like brought in a million dollars into the economy just from the disc golf courses. So now, all these people are traveling there um, specifically for that, which is kind of cool. So for those that don't know, this is the disc golf that's already around us. There's four courses in Guelph. Uh, we have three public ones, the top three there. Um, we have Victoria Park, which is a new championship level course, um, only accessible for leagues. Uh, Alma has a course. Uh, I included Paris because that's one of the nicest courses actually in southern Ontario. And as you can see, it had the most rounds played, 11,000. And then I added Four Fathers Brewing Company. They put a really cute little one in beside their brewery. Uh, and in the first year, they have 4,000 rounds recorded. And these are just rounds recorded on UDisc. And they, um, they think that there's probably about 80% more rounds being played. Just these are the ones recorded. Um, something cool to note for this, Riverside has the most use in Guelph. And that's like a very small one. I don't know if anyone has been in that park. There's nine holes, it's super accessible, um, family friendly. And then if you look at Elma, obviously Elma is very small, but uh, they kind of made their course a little bit too long, in my opinion, and the baskets are homemade. So they don't have the quality baskets, tee pads, and a little bit more difficult, so less, um, less tourism for that. So last year, uh, I took the initiative to set up my own uh, pilot course. So I purchased nine portable baskets 100 discs, and I rented uh, Laura Public School for three hours every Saturday. And I had to charge, obviously, to cover the cost, so it was $10 per family or $5 per person. And this included the disc rental, and it was really great. What happened was we had a lot of uh, multi-generations coming out to play, so we had grandparents playing with their kids. Um, we had a lot of beginners. I would say 80 to 90% of people had never played before, so that was kind of cool that they were just interested in it. And then even in the eight weeks that we had it going, we had a little bit of tourism because I put it on the UDisc app. So talking to people, we had people from Cambridge, KW, Guelph, Barrie, Toronto uh, that just saw it and just made the trip up for the day. Um, and then a lot of repeat users. So the most people we had in a three hour period was 35, which was pretty good for just eight weeks. And keep in mind, we were charging money. So if you have a permanent course um, where it's free, I think you're gonna have a lot more uh, reception, more people out. And that's all. If you guys have any questions, thank you, James. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's uh, that was a very good presentation. And uh, council, yes, Councillor McDonald. Through you, Mayor Waters. Thank you for an amazing uh, proposal. Um, so you don't want this to be pay for play? Is It'd that be, yeah, my like understanding? Free, like passive free? recreation for the community. Okay. Yeah. And um, are you willing to fundraise for this? I would if I had to, okay. but um, 
yeah, it's not very much compared to the other stuff we're putting money okay. into. Yeah. I learned so much today about <laughs> <laughs> disc golf. I'd like to actually try it. Okay. Another good thing about the, um, the permanent course, uh, they have these sleeves, so you can actually take out the baskets. So let's say it was at the Sportsplex for Fergus Fall Fair, the Highland Games, you can remove them and then put these caps on that are like flush. So it doesn't really become an issue for space and you can kind of just use it whenever the space is available. And I have just one more question, if that's some leeway. Um, who would monitor the equipment, like the actual disc? Would we keep those at oh, the, the Sportsplex discs, or? Um, hopefully, if we brought a course to the area, we could have some store that could start selling them. Okay. Like the Alma Corner Store sells discs, believe it or not, uh, right beside the ice cream. And uh, yeah, so you won't have to rent. Maybe if the Sportsplex wanted to rent them out, they could do that, um, but that's optional. Any other comments, questions? Yes, Councillor Walt. No questions. I just want to thank you for the presentation. Yeah. It was really well done and super interesting. Sounds like a great accessible opportunity for sports in Centre Wellington. Awesome. So thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, any other comments, questions? Um, I was happened to be at the high school this morning doing uh, talking about strat plans uh, with the high school kids and asking what uh, their visions were for the community and. Okay. Uh, and a number of them said they would love to see a disc golf. Uh, oh, sweet. Yep. So uh, your your presentation is very uh, timely. Nice. Uh, that way. And obviously, uh, uh, an important part of our community is our young people, and they're mm -hmm. looking for things to do. So yeah. right on. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will now uh, move into delegations. Uh, we have, uh, and we're going to go through alphabetically, or not alphabetically, but rather on the list here. So uh, uh, Linda Williamson is going to talk about parking strategies. Hi, Linda, and welcome. And you have uh, up to 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Linda Williamson, and I'm a resident at Elora, 90 Metcalf Street. And I just wanted to bring a concern of mine to, to you, the council, um, about a proper bylaw and enforcement concerning parking and noise that applies to the commercial area of Elora. Um, and I think we need something in place for this summer, if possible. I don't know how long that would take. Um, therefore, I'm asking you, the council, to seriously consider our concerns. Um, it's a big responsibility as our village is growing in size and popularity, and we need structure and plans in place for future development. And I said this before, that we need to give residents and merchants consider consideration when closing streets, taking viable parking spaces for temporary patios. We should all be consider considered equally that meaning the retail and the merchants too. This business community has become divided and if we can't come up with a fair solution for all, then I think we should go back to the way it was before pre-COVID. We were happy then embracing each other's businesses and we were a community that cared. So it's more about we need a bylaw, and we need to know the bylaw and we need to have them enforced for our downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, Comments, questions for Linda? <clears throat> yes, go ahead. Through you, Mayor Waters. Thank you, Linda, for coming. Um, so the way it was before was there was no parking authority at all and, and no uh, parking spots taken up. Um, I guess my question is, do you think there's enough accessible parking? There's not enough parking anywhere, okay. you know, especially on weekends, you know. Okay. And um, a lot of places they don't have parking where people are living in or where the Airbnbs are. Like it's just people are fluctuating in and there's no place to park, you know. Okay. And so now with Mill Street going to be closed till December, the one part of it, it's going to be even more chaotic. So I don't mm. know what to, we don't know what to do, but we just feel that, you know, um, we should just go back to having a normal town as much as we can and embracing people coming in and, you know, just making okay. it work okay. mm -hmm. for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, any other comments, questions? Okay. 
Uh, thank, thank you, Linda. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, we have next is Kathy uh, Bastian. Uh, yes, welcome, Kathy. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Kathy Bastian, and I, I am a resident and business owner in Alora. Um, at 81 Metcalf Street. I would like to discuss extended patios and the lack of fairness for Alora businesses and residents. I am a local business owner and a resident, and I am here because I want all businesses to be given the same fighting chance to grow and prosper while continuing to be considerate of our residents. Extended patio policies were set up quickly as a short-term fix in a crisis to help res restaurants deal with the pandemic. This has now turned into something that seems to be permanent, even though masking requirements have relaxed and indoor dining has returned. While I understand that you are now trying to fix some of the issues that have erupted over the last few years, I want to point out that there is still a lack of fairness for all businesses and our taxpaying citizens who are no longer feeling welcome downtown during the spring and summer seasons. Some businesses have been told that they have bad locations affecting their patio sizes. The reality is that any establishment that needs to be granted township property for an extended patio has a bad location. The county and the town are dictating what a bad location is based on what they are willing to block and not block. Some businesses get parking spots, some don't. Some get full sidewalks, some don't. Some restaurants are granted seating for four while others have seating for 24. Retail and service-based businesses have also had their challenges. We all struggled through COVID and we didn't get the same opportunities. So now there is an option for all businesses to get it. So now is there an option for all businesses to get two parking spots and have full use of the sidewalks to extend our shops or even things out? I think a lot of businesses would like additional square footage, whether it's for extending their business space to sell more products and services, provide classes or demonstrations, or offer short-term parking for the regular customers. If some proprietors have dedicated sidewalks and parking spaces, shouldn't all of us have the same option to enhance our businesses? I'm, asking, I'm, not, I'm actually not asking for that. I'm asking you to look at that as a worst case scenario and to keep things fair and reasonable for all businesses in our community, as well as our community members. If we treat all businesses equally and everyone gets parking spaces and sidewalks, what happens to our tourists and local clientele? Parking has always been an issue in Allura. It will be worse now with the upcoming East Mill Street closure, along with extended patios and business staff parking on the main streets. What about accessibility for the elderly and people with disabilities? We are at a point where a lot of our local customers are complaining and saying that they are now avoiding downtown in the summer. These are tax pay paying local residents who no longer come downtown during the summer because they feel like they have lost their town. Alora is a beautiful and unique village that is growing. I am not against that. I have been a business owner here for 17 years as well as a resident. I want all businesses to thrive. I just want a reasonable and level playing field for all taxpayers. If we aren't looking after everyone, this town will lose what makes it exceptional, and that is what makes businesses, tourists, and residents want to be here. Thank you. Uh, comments, questions from council? Okay, thank you, Kathy. Okay, thanks. Uh, Wayne, are you gonna, I see you back there, Wayne. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council. I'm Wayne Bridgman, the other half of Kathy Bastion. We own Symmetry Home, downtown Alora. I'm here before you to ask that you consider all of our businesses in downtown Alora, as well as our local residents of Senator Wellington, when you start allowing extended patios. Owning a retail, retail store, our customers have complained about the parking situation for many years but more so since COVID and the influx of tourists. 
With the upcoming East Mill Street closure, we are losing several parking spots downtown. If you are giving up parking spots for extended patios, we are losing more parking and we are taking business away from other merchants. I have heard from our customers on many occasions that they have driven in from nearby towns and cannot get close to our store, so they just went back home. Last summer, one of the establishments with an extended patio was not even using it from August onward. I emailed the township in September and they would not do anything because they had agreed upon date to end the patio season for all restaurants. Every year the extended patio season has been six months long. Is there a way to shorten it, the patio season during the colder months? Please consider putting forward a motion to force patio removals if they are not following bylaws and are not being used for a specific length of time, like 10 days in a row. Another very big point that I would like to make is public safety. We have all seen so many people, locals and tourists, walk right out onto the county road to get around a patio. Can we at least make it safe for everyone? I would also like to bring up liquor licenses. How many do we need in Alora? Do we have a cap? Maybe we have hit a maximum already. Even though we are a tourist town, we are still a small town. We are witnessing a lot more public intoxication these days, waking up residents, causing more damage to properties at night. I spoke to the township during COVID regarding road closures stopping us from ac accessing our private driveway. We live above our store. A key point that I brought up then still holds true now. Most of the businesses that are in Laura were here before COVID. They set up their business with what their buildings and properties had to offer, not using township property. The worst case scenario is that all businesses start fighting for the right to have the same use of township property. If we are giving up parking spots and blocking sidewalks, where are all pedestrians walking? How is the town accessible and where are people parking to do a quick pickup or enjoy the town? What about our own residents who are told to, to shop local and want to do that? Some of the service businesses rely strictly on local residents. Please let people walk through our beautiful town easily, safely, and be able to park in a parking spot close to the businesses they are trying to get to. By doing this, the township would be supporting every business. Thank you. Uh, comments, question for, for Wayne? Yes, go ahead, Councillor Wilder. Thank you, Wayne. I'm just curious. I personally think the shuttle bus is a pretty good solution and good idea that the township staff came up with last year, I believe, was the first year. Um, so I'm just curious about the shuttle bus and if there's a way the stores downtown could be uh, in, like marketing that more, or kind of trying to encourage people to park at their at the raceway, which is, we advertised is, it in our yeah, store. Yes, so I think that. Yeah. So are you finding that as a good solution? No. no. Is, um, is there any so way that the that shuttle the bus is, is usually sorry. July to uh, like June, July, August? Is that yeah. when it was? So just curious. Sorry. So because the reality is there's, there probably won't be enough parking for the num sheer number of people coming to Alora now. Like, it has changed yes. whether we all like it or not. <laughs> That's just the reality. So I think we do have to be creative in our solutions. So I'm just kind of was curious about that, how that could be improved to maybe meet the needs of the downtown I th businesses. I think that does help. But I think we're really here for the extended patios taking up parking spots already, not being used, um, over-serving the damage done to our businesses downtown, intoxication. The main thing is, is the everybody, most stores that are there now were there before COVID. They knew what we were all set up to do. So that's our main concern is the extended patios are taking up a lot of space and parking spots. Uh, any other uh, questions for council? Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you. Uh, Stacy. Uh, hi, Stacy, and welcome. How are you doing? 
Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for taking some of your valuable meeting time to listen to our concerns. I would like to speak to a few issues today with regards to the STRAP plan. I have spoken to a number of seniors in the township who are unaware of the survey, and while I realize it is difficult to communicate with everyone, I would like to see a short time extension made to encourage more residents to fill out the questionnaire. Was the senior center identified as a place to inform residents? The arenas, the dog park? How about the mailing list for those interested in the agenda for council? I wonder if some thought was given to promote the survey and how to do that. I am disappointed that down township admin staff did not fully inform the new council of issues associated with increased tourism in Alora thereby making our grievances unique, obtuse, and apparently to some councillors, questionable. So here we are today to iterate for this new council our issues on how half a million visitors who came to our village last year impacted our lives in the downtown. I would like to emphasize my displeasure with the lack of process with the community on patio permits for Alora. The guidelines seemed only to focus on the geographical locations of the fencing or permitted materials list and don't address whether or not the applicants actually even deserve the privilege of installing a patio and diverting people off sidewalks onto confusing walkways. Further, there were some patios that completely cut off access, making it difficult for seniors to get around, we noticed, uh, in between the two drugstores. The Zoom call about patios earlier this year was not public and was for BIA members only. It was also not conveyed as an input reading meeting, but rather a how to put together a strong application session. We have a new index of resident who has arrived who believe that their financial investments at the peak of the housing bubble should now dictate how we should roll moving ahead. There is a suggestion that those of us who've been living here on top or beside our businesses should actually move somewhere quieter. I'm here to remind those folks that residents have been living above businesses or beside them for over 185 years without the division and derision that we are now experiencing. We used to help each other. That is now not the case. I blame the township as the issues we have been communicating have been ignored and not prioritized. We are paying twice the tax base. My combined taxes on my 0 0.08 of an acre at the Alora Pottery are shy of $7,000 per year. So you can bet I will be insisting that my tax dollars reflect an enjoyment of my property just as every other homeowner expects. We have been working with the OPP and the Alcohol and Gaming Commission, and they have agreed to team up to provide township bylaw staff with reports outlining visits to the licensed establishments for non-compliance. <coughs> Council was sent a link of at least 37 videos regarding evidence of over-serving and negative outcomes that these behaviors have on the area residences. We have had bar owners literally living in their bars or setting fires in the yard to burn garbage or their clientele smoking, trashing, urinating or vomiting on our lawns and buildings. These owners then thumbing their nose to those of us asking to please be respectful only to have owners bragging that the OPP and township staff are too busy to enforce the bylaws. This is our life now. Please consider making the OPP and the AGCO reports part of your decision process for approving patio permits. It's the least township staff can do until there are commercial noise bylaws implemented hopefully by the summer. Please also consider additional bylaw staff, perhaps by taxing the Airbnbs, restaurants and bars to pay for this additional oversight. Patios should be a privilege, not a right. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Comments, question from council. 
Yes, go ahead, Councillor McDonald. Through you, Mayor Waters. So thank you for coming, Stacy. Um, so are you asking for there to be more collaboration between OPP and bylaw to come up with a more concrete plan? Is that what I'm right. understanding? Right, I think that just because you apply for a, per a permit doesn't mean that you actually get it because you filled in the blanks on the design guidelines. Okay. It should be a privilege. And if you're not behaving during the year in your neighborhood, mm -hmm. then you don't get to have a patio in the next summer. We need to be um, noticing where our taxpayer resources are going. So if our OPP and our bylaw are spending a lot of time in our downtown, you know, lecturing businesses on how to behave, well, I don't really think that <laughs> they should be rewarded mm -hmm. in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank I you. That. Uh, any other comments or questions? No. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Uh, we, next, uh, we have uh, to speak to this is uh, Marianne Neville. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, thank you for the privilege of coming here to talk to you. Basically, much of what I had to say is, uh, has already been said, and I'd like to endorse the rest of the delegation and what they have said. But I'm somewhat different from them. Unlike them, I am a, just an ordinary citizen, not a business owner. And I live very, very close to an infamous bar that ha is as infamous for its uh, nighttime noise, public disturbances, and breach of the liquor license. And this has gone on for at least four years. And it took, in the past, um, if you call the OPP about the noise, well, you got the answer, it's a bar, what do you expect? And it was only a former council member that went to bat for us neighbors. And he, when he was told with, by the OPP this, he said, will I have to go to the commissioner of the OPP about this matter? Well, they were over there within hours. Again, he approached the Liquor Control Board and uh, they said um, they were, he told them what was going on and they had inspectors over and they, things started to improve after that, but have not improved any great. There is still, as one of my colleagues here said, He's, there are videos of really, really dreadful behaviors. And this is not what Alora is, as far as I can tell. So I'm, I just want to reiterate some of the things that were said, because I live very, very close to this. And the, the big problem is this walkway, this very, I would call it a jerry-built walkway, that is taking over the whole sidewalk, as well as giving, you know, um, the cafe service there. And so people don't realize that this walkway is where they're supposed to walk. So they walk right out into the traffic on the other side of all the parked cars. And so it's really dangerous, and especially if the road is open this season, it's a real hazard. So as I say, I am a neighbor. I live above one of the stores, very close to this bar. And um, I have problem with, with parking. I have no parking spot at all. And so when the uh, season is on and the, the uh, officers, uh, parking uh, control officers on the job, I have to keep an eye on the clock and keep moving my car. And the other thing that, that is a concern of mine, and I wrote about it last year and got really no response, I don't know if you folks realize that all the public parking lots have a 24-hour limit and it says subject to towing. Well, this is not very practical for people who have no parking, and I'm not the only one. There are many I know on Metcalf, and I would suggest that the um, people who live on, above the stores in Mill Street again have no parking. So here's a problem. If you're sick, 
if you go away for a weekend, if it's bad weather, can you, you can't get out and, and move your car within 24 hours. Everyone I've ever said it to, though, says, oh, no, they, they won't tow you. Well, I don't want to take that gamble. So it just seems to me that it's one of those things that the idea sounded good, and there wasn't really any consideration of what the long-term ramifications would be for people like me. And there are many of us without any parking at all. And um, I said to somebody, you know, I'm a taxpayer too. Oh, no, you're a renter. I said, it's in my rent. I do pay taxes too. So, you know, I just would hope, and this was my... Um, Oh, and about the bylaw, yeah, I've already talked about that, but I would hope that in council deliberations and in staff recommendations that the well-being of our citizens, like me, all of us, it'll be, they will, our needs will be regarded as well as commercial interests. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, uh, any questions? Thank you for your uh, <laughs> thank presentation. You, thank thank you. you for listening to my rant. Uh, can we ask uh, that McLean uh, come forward now? Thank you. Welcome, McLean. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, councillors, uh, Mayor Waters, and township staff. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm here uh, representing uh, owners and operators of patios on township property. Um, as we look toward another season of patios, I wanted to share with you how vital these patios are to our businesses and to the village in general. I'd like to begin by sharing for a little bit of historical context for everyone why these patios uh, came to be in the first place. And of course, that was a reaction to COVID. Uh, our council's quick movement in that regard uh, arguably uh, helped our businesses succeed and we're all still here. So for that, uh, that's why the patio policy started. Um, but looking towards the future, the economic recovery from COVID is far from over, even if the illness is hopefully behind us. Uh, the initial patios that were done in that first summer were thrown together quickly. And our only real concern was uh, barriers in place to ensure the safe service of alcohol, as in fencing at a certain height and sort of some restricting of movement. Uh, but year two and beyond, this changed drastically. Uh, upon urging from township staff and the former council, the bylaw was created that governed our operations and the creation of our patios. Uh, it also provided the framework for liability insurance. In that first year, none of us possessed liability insurance for those patio extensions, so things could have been quite bad. However, now we all do, uh, and that's a result of that bylaw framework. Um, in order to obtain these permissions, we all have had to conform to the building code and to AGCO re regulations at large. I would also like to note that the previous council approved this bylaw unanimously. Please note that in order to conform to these bylaws, significant uh, expenses have been incurred. Uh, I'm going to speak for my business only in this regard but the Evelyn's expense to create that patio was in excess of $40,000. Um, and that was an expense that we agreed upon because the discussion was that these patios would exist uh, in some level of perpetuity. Um, I'd like to say that the shape of my, pia of my patio sorry, was actually created by suggestion of Andy Goldie, the former CAO, the former Mayor Linton, and Rob Rosso, who when I asked for simply just the sidewalk, they suggested the patio or the the parking spaces adjacent to my building on James Street. Uh, so naturally, I, I jumped at that opportunity. That's great. That's more space. Um, that same group approached John Lorenzic at the Allure Brewing Company to build in the garden that their township patio exists in. Um, so I just wanted to point out that that was at urging of council that we built the patios that we built. Uh, when it comes to the compliance of AGCO regulations, it's in all of our best interest to follow these rules. Not doing so would put our licenses at risk. And just to note, we are more than happy to work with council and the AGCO and the OPP to remain compliant. We had a meeting last year where we did just that, 
and I would contend that we would all continue to have those discussions at any time it was requested of us because it's in our best interest to ensure the safe service of alcohol and ultimately the protection of property, you know, keeping intoxication to a minimum. Um, I'd also like to say that in terms of bylaw, our patios are only allowed to serve alcohol, the extensions anyway, until 10 p.m. And we all follow that mostly religiously as far as I can see. And in regard to intoxication, uh, that's not exclusive to patio extensions. Like People are going to drink too much no matter where they are. Um, I would like to share a statistic uh, from a study done by the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Areas. Um, they looked at the CAFE TO policy in 2021. I have the study here. I can leave behind if you'd like to read it. Uh, and this was a study comparing parking revenues to uh, revenue created by patios on parking spaces. Uh, and the results are quite staggering. I'm not going to share the whole report, uh, but $181 million of revenue was generated on these cafe patios compared to $3.7 million in parking revenue. So parking versus patios, it's fairly clear where the financial benefit is. Now, where does this money go? Employees, suppliers, farmers, taxes. Um, of course, Toronto and Alora are not the same place, but uh, it would be my contention that clear parallels exist when considering parking versus patios. Uh, also, uh, one other point is we've had a challenge in this village from the level of tourism that we see, and there's not enough seats to feed all the people that visit this place on a Saturday or a Sunday. And these patio extensions help to mitigate some of that risk, or some of that challenge, I should say. Um, there's one vital thing, too, that these patio extensions create, um, and that is employment. Um, just speaking with uh, a few of my colleagues here, uh, we employ during the patio season, the summer season, an additional 50 people combined uh, in this village uh, during that two and a half, three month period. Uh, the majority of these jobs go to local youth. These summer jobs provide money for college, money for rent, and in some cases, money to help out families. Restaurant employment provides valuable life lessons, like the importance of hard work, punctuality, and how to work well under pressure. Anyway, um, we as businesses benefit from the continued support of the local government and being given these opportunities. It is this support and thoughtful foresight from our elected representatives that has allowed our town to blossom into one of the most desirable places in the province to live in and to visit. Streetside patios go hand in hand with the growth of this village. Please consider that when voting to approve patios for another season. Thank you for your time. And if there's any questions, I'd happily answer them. Thank you, McLean. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor McDonald. Through you, Mayor Waters. Um, when you mentioned liability insurance, McLean, and, and thank you for your presentation. Um, so each owner ha of a patio has their own liability insurance? Correct. That's the requirement? Yeah. So okay. it's, we, we extend our policies to reflect that space, or we add township to our policies. Okay. And it's a $5 million uh, liability plan that we have to possess. So if something happens on your patio, you get sued, not the township? That's correct. Okay. Or at least, at least we share the responsibility <laughs> from a fine. Hopefully, we don't have a ten million dollar uh, result in a lawsuit. But yes, correct. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other comments? Yes, uh, Councillor Jefferson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, McLean, was the alcohol until 10 p.m. on the patio? Was that always the way it was, or is that just coming into this new year? No, no. Patio extensions from the start. It's 10 p.m. on township patios. My understanding was that was the first summer as well. In fact, now that I'm looking back, it was, it's been since then. So 10 p.m. is when you have to, not just alcohol service, people. Like, we're so not allowed. everybody has to be you off? You can't be on that patio after 10 o'clock. Now, if you possess a patio, like I have a small patio at the back of the restaurant, that under AGCO regulation allows me to operate until 11 p.m., or like, for example, uh, we'll use the Badley as an example, that's not a township patio, so he can have people and service out there up to noise bylaw, which is 11 o'clock. But the, the township patios is 10 o'clock. And not just alcohol service, but service in general. Like, we're supposed to do our best to 
usher people back into, this, in, into the indoor part of the restaurant or to move on altogether. Okay, thanks. Yes, Councillor McDonald. Are you Mayor Waters? Um, still recognizing that we're soft landing COVID, um, you know, as a business owner, um, have you achieved your return since the pandemic, you know, uh, economically, like for your business? Have, have like, you, are we back to full strength? Yeah. I would say that we're back to full strength in regards to revenue, okay. hopefully, because there's no capacity restrictions or times of service restrictions. So we have the potential to be back. Uh, but many of us, and I'll, I can speak personally, we took on additional debt related yeah. to COVID to yeah. keep our doors open, to keep our employees paid, uh, and that still exists. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's not over. No. But the revenue has returned to full strength, I hope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you, Council. Thank you, McLean, for your presentation. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so we're going to move. Uh, we've finished with this portion, uh, and thank you everyone for doing your presentation. So, if you'd like to stay, you can. If you want to move along, you can move along. Uh, we're going to go into consideration of reports. So, uh, item 7.1 nomination of Lake Erie Source Protection uh, Committee representative, and we have, a, we have a report from Kyle. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Mayor Waters, members of council, I'm here to present the staff report for you regarding the nomination of a municipal representative for the Lake Erie Source Protection Committee. Uh, Councillor John Spoulis from the Township of Puslinch, who is the current member, is, is here with me and we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, just by way of brief summary, uh, the Lake Erie Source Protection Committee oversees the source protection uh, process, including the Grand River Source Protection Plan, which the township is uh, subject to. And John, uh, Councillor Sapoulis, has uh, served uh, ably for not only the Township of Centre Wellington, but also the other municipalities in Wellington County and the other, and for a total of 17 municipalities in his municipal grouping for the last uh, five years. Uh, the report in front of you is to consider his nomination for another four year term, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Comments, questions from Council? Okay, and uh, thank you, John, for uh, coming out today. So we have a recommendation that the Council of Township of Centre Wellington nominate John Sapoulis as a municipal representative for the Wellington County, Halton Region, Dufferin County, and Gray County Municipal Grouping Number 1 for the Lake Erie Source Protection Committee. Do I have a mover for that? A mover by Councillor Wilton, Council, uh, seconded by Councillor McDonald. All those in favour? That's so moved. Thank you. Okay, we will go to item uh, 7.2, Pierpoint Research Project uh, Update uh, Report from Marianne, Mariana, and uh, yes, welcome, Mariana. Thank you, Mayor Waters, through you to members of council. So the report before you contains recommendations that are the culmination of um, work that's been done over the past year on the Pierpoint Settlement Research Project. And that has come out of an initial project that was uh, larger on the cultural heritage landscape study. So that began in 2019, uh, and this research project uh, stemmed from that began last year, so it's been about a year. And we have the consultants here from Archaeological Services Inc. who have been working with us on this project to present the research, the findings, and the recommendations. And so I will, uh, I'm introducing now Annie Veyu from ASI and Rebecca Chiara is here as well. And so Annie will be giving the overview of the presentation and then I will come back and uh, discuss the staff recommendations. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. It is a pleasure to be here to present um, the Pure Point Settlement Research Project. Um, this presentation will provide an overview of the project background, its purpose and goals, our methodology and process, a summary of research and engagement undertaken as part of this project, and also provide an overview of results, recommendations, and next steps. Okay. 
In June 2021, Council endorsed the Cultural Heritage Landscape Study and Inventory for the Township of Center Wellington. The Pierpoint Settlement was considered as a Potential Cultural Heritage Landscape, or CHL, as part of the CHL Study and Inventory, as suggested by members of the public. Pierpoint is generally recognized as the earliest known non-Indigenous settlement within Center Wellington. The area is associated with the early Black Canadian community and is a significant piece of the Township's history and the history of Black Canadians. It is understood that Richard Pierpoint was granted land in Garifraxa Township in 1822. His property consisted of the east half of Lot 6, Concession 1, on the outskirts of what is now Fergus. Richard Pierpoint was designated a National Historic Person by Parks Canada in 2020 in recognition of his life experience, hardships, and contributions as a Black Loyalist in Upper Canada. As part of the evaluation methodology used in the CHL study and inventory, candidate CHLs were evaluated to determine the, their cultural heritage value, community value, and historical integrity. So what was there in the past that is still present today that should be protected? The CHLs that were prioritized for inclusion on the inventory were those with identified physical attributes to be protected and managed, and 18 significant CHLs were identified. The Pierpoint Settlement was not identified as a significant CHL at that time. So very briefly, the Provincial Policy Statement defines a CHL as a defined geographical area that may have been modified by human activity and is identified as having cultural heritage value or interest by a community, including an Indigenous community. And CHLs fall within um, three categories developed by UNESCO, just generally. They can be intentionally designed, they can organically, involve over, organically evolve over time by association with and in response to the natural environment, and then there are also associative landscapes, which are more about the powerful cultural, artistic, spiritual uh, community associations of the natural environment. So one of the key recommendations to come out of the CHL study and inventory was that further research be conducted on the Pierpoint settlement to understand its potential historical integrity, its boundary, and that further and more focused consultation be undertaken to further understand the significance of this place to the community. The report also recommended that the area should be considered for an interpretation or commemoration plan to disseminate the history to the broader, broader community. While the report provided a number of short, medium, and long-term recommendations, the Township prioritized the Pierpoint Settlement Research Project as the first recommendation to address coming out of the CHL study. Running concurrently with the Pierpoint Settlement Research Project is the Centre Wellington CHL Official Plan Amendment Project to formally recognize those 18 significant CHLs that were identified as part of the CHL study. Um, ASI was retained by the Township of Central Wellington to support the development of an interpretation framework for the Pierpoint Settlement through research and engagement with the public. The goal of the Pierpoint Settlement Research Project was to conduct research to further understand the history, location, and significance of Richard Pier's, Pierpoint's property, and in consultation with the, with the public and stakeholders, to determine appropriate protection, interpretation, or commemoration strategies to recognize and broaden awareness of Pierpoint's significance and history. The Pierpoint Settlement Research Project entailed making connections, gathering information, research. We had a wonderful public workshop, uh, development of an interpretation framework, and it's culminating today um, at this council meeting today. So what I'm going to do now is walk you through our methodology, providing some highlights for each of the phases. I'll then provide a summary of results and recommendations. The first phase of the project focused on making connections with interested individuals and stakeholders and to gather information. A project website was created and launched on the township's webpage at the start of the project. The project website included a description of the project, including project goals and general timelines, and provides a link to the Centre Wellington Cultural Heritage Landscape Study and Inventory project page to, to connect the dots. Uh, regular updates were posted on the website throughout the project to notify the public of the status of the project and to share materials and a summary of results from the community workshop. A number of individuals and groups were contacted by the consultant team as part of the init initial phases of the project. Communication was through email with some follow-up over the phone, and recipients were provided information on the project, including goals, timelines, and links to the project pages. Stakeholders were also invited to share information regarding the Pierpoint settlement that could potentially assist in this research project. 
Stakeholders contacted included a range of historians and academics, local residents, a range of museums and archives, representatives of historical and heritage societies and organizations, including the Guelph Black Historical Society, as well as the Center Wellington Black Committee. Generally, outreach activities occurred um, between the end of April and the end of June 2022, with some follow-up in the fall. As part of the initial outreach and gathering of information, the township also invited the public through their website to provide information um, and to ask questions if they had any. Uh, responses received by the consultant team of the township ranged from a stated interest in the project and a desire to be kept informed to the sharing of specific feedback, documents, and sources of information, as well as suggestions as to who else we should reach out to as part of the in initial information gathering. Uh, next came our research phase. Research findings were based on a review of available archival records, published accounts of oral history, secondary source publication, and historical mapping. Efforts were made to follow up on feedback and information pertaining to a potential settlement or a cabin, including the potential location of a cabin, and to Richard Pier Pierpoint's presence and movements in West Garifraxa and the Niagara area between 1822, when he was issued a land ticket in this area, and his death around 1838. So feedback and information that was shared that was related more to Pierpoint's personal life, but which did not help advance our, an understanding of the potential settlement or cabin, um, uh, was not further pursued through research activities as part of this project. Our research focused on Richard Pierpoint and his land grant in Garifraxa Township, but also touched on themes of black, early black land ownership and black settlement in the area and Upper Canada more broadly. A community workshop was held on in December at the Alora Community Center. The sen session was advertised on the township's website, local paper, on social media, and emails were sent out to stakeholders, individuals, and organizations that were part of the initial outreach. The workshop was open to all members of the public. Over 70 people attended the session, and the session provided an introduction to the project, including a brief overview of the CHL Wellington, um, the Center Wellington CHL study and inventory recommendations specific to the Pierpoint settlement, as well as a summary of findings of the initial outreach, information gathering, and historical research. Following the presentation and a short Q&A period, participants were asked to partake in a discussion at their tables. So each table was asked the following three questions. What is significant about Richard Pierpoint and his property? What are the stories that should be protected and shared? How should the stories be told? Where should they be told? Uh, and what are some potential interpretive tools that could be used to recognize and broaden awareness of Pierpoint's significance and history in the township and beyond? Members of the con consultant team circulated around the room to answer questions, but Generally, it was a um, self-directed uh, discussion at each table, and then each table was then asked to share a summary of their discussions. Uh, responses to the first question about the significance of Richard Pierpoint and his property and which stories should be protected and shared ranged from specific stories of Richard Pierpoint and his land grant to broader stories of black history, um, from Pierpoint's military service and history of black loyalists, as well as a history of strict restrictions on black land ownership in Upper Canada. In terms of how and where the story should be told and which interpretive tools could be used to recognize and broaden awareness of Pierpoint's significance, feedback shared ranged from interpretation and commemoration to education and further research. You can see that suggestions um, are, some of them are very site specific, while others are broader, take a broader local and multi-jurisdictional um, uh, level. Uh, following the community workshop, the Centre Wellington Black Committee shared a document to serve as a supplement to the information that had already been gathered from the community. This document consists of a recommendation proposal for the Pierpoint Fly Fishing Nature Reserve, or the Pierpoint Park as it is often locally referred to, and was prepared by the Centre Wellington Black Committee and the Pierpoint Neighbourhood Group. The proposal focuses on recognizing and celebrating the significance of Richard Pierpoint and early black settlement in the area while continuing to protect and preserve the natural and ecological importance of the park, a popular destination for fly fishers. Research findings combined with the results from the community engagement program reveal that the Pierpoint property represents a number of historical themes determined to be important to the develop development of the township of Centre Wellington and which are outlined in the CHL study and inventory. Key themes associated with the property, both historically and today, include, but may not be limited to, physiography and nature, settlement, agriculture, transportation, industry, and community development. 
While this research project started with a focus on enhancing understanding of the Pierpoint settlement and its potential location, research and engagement with the community revealed that there were many significant stories to tell, both within the property but also more broadly. For example, we know that Richard Pierpoint and his property in Garifraxa is part of the larger story of waves of black settlement and displacement in Upper Canada. But more locally, his property has been identified as a stopping point, a place of rest and refuge for black individuals and families on their journey to set down roots in what was once known as the Queen's Bush to the north. Following Pierpoint's death and the sale of his property in 1838, the property saw the establishment of a mill and early bridge crossing as seen on historic historical mapping as well as associations with potential agricult agricultural land uses, as suggested by associations with Blackburn Farms. Pierpoint's property, and more specifically the part of the property that was donated to the township to create the Pierpoint Fly Fishing Nature Reserve, has since developed into a site of commemoration, recreation, stewardship, and community development. These are all themes that were identified as being significant to the township. What was one Richard Pierpoint's property could be considered as an evolved and associative cultural heritage landscape. So briefly, based on our findings, we have made the following recommendations. So it's recommended that Pierpoint's, part of Pierpoint's land grant should be considered for inclusion on the Center Wellington CHL landscape inventory as a significant CHL for its associations with a number of historical themes determined to be important to the development of the municipality as these themes are especially reflected within the section of Pierpoint's property that now encompasses the Pierpoint Fly Fishing Nature Reserve, the Nature Reserve's boundaries should be considers, considered as preliminary boundaries of the potential CHL. Should Council approve the inclusion of the Pierpoint Fly Fishing Nature Reserve as a significant CHL, the township's official plan, um, in the township's official plan, it can be added to the ongoing official plan amendment project to formally recognize significant CHLs in the township. Recommendation two, it is recommended that the Township of Centre Wellington develop a working group with members of staff and members of the public, for example, representatives of the Centre Wellington Black Committee, uh, the Pierpoint Neighborhood Group, or other interested parties, to work together to further develop an interpretation or commemoration program for the Pierpoint property. This program can build on the information contained in our report and in the proposal prepared by the Centre Wellington Black Committee and the Pierpoint Neighborhood Group. Should the Pierpoint Fly Fishing Nature Reserve be recognized as a significant CHL by Council, consideration should be given to the development of a management or stewardship plan for the Pierpoint Fly Fishing Nature Reserve in collaboration with the working group. The management or stewardship plan could include recommendations for further research within the Nature Reserve as appropriate. Thank you. Uh, any comments or questions from Council uh, at this stage? Okay. Mariana, maybe come uh, back and provide your, us with your information. Thank you. Thanks through you. Thank you, Annie, for that. Um, so basically, staff have taken the recommendations uh, that were made in the report and are building on those to try to uh, begin implementation. <clears throat> so one of the first recommendation is obviously that council uh, receive the report for information, specifically the um, consultant's summary report on the findings. And then uh, what, we're, what staff is recommending is that the Fly Fishing Res Nature Reserve be added as the 19th significant cultural heritage landscape to that project, to the inventory, and then um, that it also be added to the official plan amendment project that's ongoing now, identifying it as significant. And then uh, the next part of that uh, recommendation that uh, was just discussed was um, to create a community uh, working group. So it would be staff reporting back on what would be um, recommendations to create that working group, what the resources might look like, and uh, how that would function, um, and how uh, people would be selected to be on that committee. So it would be a report back on that. And then also, um, staff is recommending that there is sufficient information now to determine the property to be uh, of significance under the Ontario Heritage Act, so to pursue designation under Part 4 of the Ontario Heritage Act to protect it in perpetuity. And so staff would bring forward a report on that, uh, on that aspect based on the research, but a little bit more has to be done just in terms of writing a statement of value and bringing that forward and then um, asking council to state its notice of intent to designate that property. So those are the four recommendations that were made. 
and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Council, comments, questions? Thank you, through you, Mayor Waters. Just really want to thank the research team for all the work they did on this. I really like the fact that it came forward that this was a resting spot and a refuge, because I think that's also the intent from an ecological perspective. There can be a passive kind of environmental sensitive lands landscape there so I think that's really great so I don't really have a question just really wanted to thank the team for uh, doing the work and bringing this forward to council today any other comments questions from council seeing none I have a recommendation that the council of township of center Wellington receives for information the peer point settlement settlement research project interpretation framework report prepared by archaeological service Inc provided as attachment one to the staff report, PLN 2023-17, uh, and that the Pierpoint Fly Fishing uh, Nature Reser uh, Reserve be added to the Center of Wellington Cultural Heritage Landscape Inventory and Cultural Heritage Landscape Official Plan Amendment Project as identified sig significant cultural heritage landscapes, and that the staff be directed to bring forward a report concerning heritage designation of Pierpoint Fly Fishing Nature Reserves as a significant cultural heritage landscapes under Part 5 uh, of the Ontario uh, Heritage Act. And that, um, uh, was that 5 or 6, sorry, 1V. Uh, and that staff be directed to report back to the development of Pierpoint Community Working Group to uh, advance uh, work associated with the Pierpoint Research Project. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Wilton, a mover. Seconder, Councillor Craddock. All those in favour? So moved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, We'll continue on with uh, parking uh, stuff like that. Uh, 7.3, 2023 parking strategy uh, report from uh, CEO Dan Wilson. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Um, so this report outlines the proposed uh, parking strategy for 2023. Um, just a, a, a note, we do plan on doing a long-term parking strategy uh, development this year. Um, this is uh, something that we could hopefully implement in 2024, um, but we need some type of process and strategy in place for 2023, so this report outlines the recommended approach uh, for the upcoming summer. First area is parking availability and street closures. Uh, for Alora, uh, given East Mill will be under construction for the majority of the summer, all of the summer, uh, we are recommending no planned street closures in Alora for 2023. Um, this is something that was discussed with the Alora BIA and they, they understand that uh, street closures would cause a lot more congestion and confusion with, with East Mill being out of commission for the year. Um, so that is the recommended approach for Alora. Uh, for Fergus, uh, we are proposing to continue to close Provost Lane uh, from St. Andrew Street West up to where the back of the buildings are on, on St. Andrew Street West uh, from May 15th to approximately October 31st every day. And that would be a permanent closure um, as it was the last uh, two years. Um, that doesn't really affect parking. Um, I guess people are used to having that closure every year, so we're recommending to continue uh, another year of that closure. From a parking enforcement perspective, um, as you know, we have been using um, a third party to assist us with parking enforcement over the last two years, uh, Alpha Technology Systems, Inc. Um, we are proposing that we continue using Alpha for another year, 2023, um, and that we would reassess as part of the long-term parking strategy that we're working on this year. Um, so moving forward, uh, you will see in Appendix D to my report that we have a number of statistics for the 2022 enforcement um, activity. Uh, you can see there are certain areas that are um, very active in terms of enforcement, um, but we would continue on and, and assume or, or encourage, recommend that we use the same um, level of service from Alpha in 2023 that we had in, in 2022 and 2021. Um, the boundaries for, for that um, three hour and 15 minute parking enforcement are shown in attachment A to my report. Uh, so that is identical to the boundaries we used in 2022. Uh, from a parking enforcement revenue perspective, um, everything does flow through Wellington County. 
Uh, we did have discussions with Wellington County last year around revenue sharing, and they have agreed to, to provide a portion of the revenues back to the township. And that started in 2021, where we received roughly $4,300 back. It was a partial year of enforcement, plus there was some, uh, some software development fees that we had to pay for in, in the first year. Uh, so we received a minor amount in, in to, from 2021. Uh, for 2022, um, so far received um, enforcement revenue of about $122,000 and we're going to receive roughly $87,000 of that. Um, again, uh, the county is, is keeping a portion of the funds for the increased administration charge of, of the parking enforcement in Centre Wellington. And the county has agreed to for, uh, continue on a similar formula for 2023. From a private parking perspective, uh, we do have a private parking bylaw. Uh, it has not been utilized to date, I believe. Uh, no, it hasn't. Um, but it is there and offered as a service to, to property owners. So this is where unauthorized vehicles um, are using private or municipal property outside of the right-of-way. And they, these property owners can um, sign up for this through the township and our bylaw enforcement officers would enforce parking in their private property. Uh, they get the benefit of the enforcement, but the revenue generated comes back to both the county and, and the township. So it's it's uh, revenue generation for, for the township and the county, but enforcement activity for, for private property owners. So that is available for use, but we, to date we have not had anybody sign up for it. That was implemented last year for last year's uh, season. Next section is the shuttle program. Uh, we did start a shuttle program in 2022, and we are recommending uh, another year of the shuttle program for 2023. Um, attachment B to my report shows the recommended route of that shuttle. We did change it slightly from, from the 2022 route. Uh, we added another stop in Fergus. Um, the, the f last year, the, the only stop in Fergus was uh, near the Fergus Marketplace. Uh, we've added another stop at um, 739 St. Andrew Street West, just coming into Fergus from Alora. Um, the owner of that lot has agreed uh, for township use of, of their parking lot for uh, for a shuttle and, and for parking. Um, so that provides another stop on, on the um, west side of Fergus that can help with, with parking as well. Uh, so that was added and we've changed the downtown Alora stop to be here at One McDonald Square. It just helps get them away from the construction at East Mill and, and congesting um, the, the lower hill area of, of Alora. Um, so so that, that change was made. Uh, but there are eight stops in total shown in attachment B and it would take roughly an hour, a little under an hour to, to do the full cycle and end up back at the OLG facility uh, to do it all over again. <coughs> we are proposing um, operating the shuttle weekends and holidays uh, from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. over the summer period. And we have applied for a grant through, um, through Wellington County, um, a BR&E grant to help pay for a portion of the, of the shuttle. Uh, the last section of, of the report is with respect to patios, cafes, sidewalks, sidewalk displays on municipal property. Um, so this was something that was initiated temporarily as part of COVID, but in uh, 2022, the previous council did approve a permanent bylaw to make this program permanent. And I've included that bylaw in attachment C to my report. Um, and this bylaw is structured to ensure that every eligible business has the same opportunity to, to apply for a permit for either a patio cafe or a sidewalk display. Um, so we are in the process of reviewing um, applications for the 2023 year. Um, this is something the bylaw doesn't require staff to come back to council for approval. It's, it's just a process identified through the bylaw. Um, yes, some do take up a few parking spaces uh, but staff believe the overall community and tourism benefits of these patios and displays um, are worth continuing on as, as a permanent program. From a funding perspective, uh, we anticipate the parking enforcement and the shuttle program to cost approximately $150,000 um, and, and that would be funded through previous parking enforcement revenue as well as the county BRNE grant. Um, so we're not anticipating any, any shortfalls from a funding perspective. 
we are reaching out to other other businesses in the area um, to see if they can contribute to this as well uh, that concludes the presentation this was really a a group effort uh, many staff were involved in in trying to develop this so uh, we will circulate the questions as needed thank you thank you Dan uh, comments questions from council Councillor McDonald through you Mayor Waters um, okay there's a few things I heard loud and clear today so wheelchair parking spots accessibility parking spots where do we stand with that in an overall plan because I know there's two here but on main areas where accessibility is key to go to a patio to go to a coffee shop there's none so Metcalf Gettys uh, West Mill um, East Mill will be closed I know there's one I believe further up so that part yeah for sure uh, uh, through Mayor Waters so uh, yeah so we evaluate requests for accessible parking spaces um, and uh, we do have um, uh, them kind of scattered throughout the both downtowns and strategic locations kind of uh, geographically kind of spreading them out um, in, in different spots if there's uh, a request for additional locations um, or um, if there's a, a spot being lost like on East Mill I, I believe we're gonna lose a, an accessible mm -hmm. spot along there uh, there may be opportunity to do um, establish one uh, create some temporary signage and, uh, and make sure that we've offset anything that we've lost but if there's uh, uh, some additional ones some requests uh, yeah we'd, we'd be happy to to hear the request and, and discuss the opportunity with uh, with the requesting party okay I'm requesting if we can look at that For I'm sure. just gonna put that out there um, the other thing was um, uh, residents that live downtown and so I've, I've heard I've, I've had some write to me actually um, that their vehicle was told they were told to park at the LCBO that parking and their vehicle was told towed and so I guess maybe some feedback from OPP or how many or you know in my role I don't want to create hardship for folks that live here that's that's not my goal and I want to alleviate that as much as possible and so when I hear of someone who lives downtown but cannot park near where they live is there a way of grandfathering in through this plan some passes for them or is that the private bylaw you were speaking about maybe I'm confused uh, th through Mayor Waters I can I can start to answer that question maybe others can can help um, we d we were asked by the previous council to investigate um, like a parking permit system okay. uh, for residents and and due to um, bylaw requirements and and a lot of administration requirements we we're, we have been, uh, been unable to initiate such a permit system and it's something we want to look at more fully as part of the long-term parking strategy that would be for effective 2024 um, one of the main concerns last year was with the street closures there were residents that physically couldn't get close to their to their to their homes in downtowns because of the street closures and uh, we're somewhat alleviating that this year without with, by not having the street closures okay. uh, but yes there are others that have been requesting a, a permitting system and, and to this point we have been unable to provide one but we are looking at that as part of a long-term solution okay and just one more question mayor waters if I could have some leeway um, I heard a suggestion today what if we just not do a parking contract are we already locked in that we've we've uh, committed to like a three four year plan with with the contract or could we just waive it all together and see what happens uh, through mayor waters we are not committed um, we need council's direction through this report to sign an agreement to continue parking enforcement for 2023 okay. um, staff do believe though that the parking enforcement has dramatically helped with with um, the turnaround of, of parking spots and people not staying in one spot all day or for, for multiple days and it does help alleviate part of the parking problems in our downtowns um, so we would have some some concern about 
not doing enforcement for a year, it may just make the problem worse. Okay. And is there a possibility for us to look after the parking tickets instead of running them through? I believe they go through the police board and then it's stamped by council, county council, and I was made aware that those funds would be coming back. I wasn't aware they were keeping that much of the portion. I do question the administrative costs because we provided the software. And in speaking with one of the officers downtown last summer uh, of that contract, he said it's automatic, like it's, right? So is there a possibility we could look after that? Uh, through Mayor Waters, that is something we're definitely mindful of and considering as part of the long-term okay. strategy. Um, we. We've been having initial conversations with the county on that and, and we'll continue to do so, um, but not not in time for 2023. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Yes, Councillor Walton. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Uh, thanks for the report, Ben. Uh, I'm just curious what the shuttle bus, because as I mentioned before, I think it's cool, so that's a good idea. I'm just curious with a couple things, the ridership last year, how well it went, and then also if there's opportunities to further promote it and. Uh, Maybe work with the BIAs to do some kind of incentives like prizes and things if they took the shuttle into town and st stuff like that. And third part of it is if Pearl Hospitality is being encouraged to encourage their guests to use it as much as possible because I think that's probably where a lot of parking jam is coming from as well. So. Uh, through Mayor Waters, I can start to answer that question and then I believe Kristen Drexler is here. She can see if I leave anything out. Um, we. We didn't have very good ridership last year, and and I th I think that's something we <clears throat> are very mindful of in setting the strategy for this year. Um, we are involving our tourism division a lot more in in the promotion of of this of the shuttle. We're hoping to have what we're calling um, a township ambassador on on the on the shuttle at all times to to talk to the people that are that are on the shuttle. Um, we are involving the BIAs and, and the businesses in, in our downtowns to, to actively promote the shuttle program. Um, so I, I think it's something we want to try to see if we can improve on the ridership that we had last year. Just curious about the Pearl Hospitality, if they can be encouraged to promote ridership and also maybe second to that is if they can uh, help sponsor it, perhaps. We can have discussions with Pearl, yes. Any other comments, questions from uh, Council? Yes, Councillor Jefferson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just in taking into listening to the delegates that came in to speak earlier, with uh, there seems to be upset with the liquor licenses on the patios, and it seems to be a bit of a point of contention with anybody. Um, if you have any, <laughs> I guess, complaints against your license and you get an inspector to come in and then you have something that's done against your license is that able to be obtained by townships so that like as Stacy was saying that it should be a privilege to have a patio and not to be abused is there anything there that the township can follow along with with the bylaws so that we know that they're doing proper, like alcohol services and things like that, that they are closing at 10, that they are following up with the noise at 11. <laughs> I just want to, because it is a privilege, like yeah. it is, and you want to be able to maintain it, and you don't want it to be run roughshod and doing whatever you want to do, and I appreciate all the work you do in our community as well. <laughs> sure, uh, so through you, Mayor Waters, uh, I've, I've had discussions with AGCO, and they've asked that um, we request specific licenses from specific businesses. We can't ask for a township-wide request. So if we have any information we're requesting, it's got to be specific to that address, and they'll, they're happy to provide that information for our reviews um, as we need. So then if complaints come in about a specific patio that's maybe not following the rules, then you can request that, and then can that influence the decision on if they will get a patio for that year? That's something we have to have discussions with uh, with our committee. Um, I don't, I can't provide you an answer on that because I don't see her at the committee. Um, but it's something that I can, we can definitely look at um, in, in, in doing so. Okay. Yeah. Is that 
Is anything about that included? Like I can see I can't barbecue on my patio and I can't have my little heater and things like that. Like is that, I'm not seeing anything in here about that. Sorry. In our patio policy. Sorry, like with I, the, I'm, sorry, yeah. with infractions on like your license or your liquor license or is it? When it comes to the, the alcohol, that's a permit issued by the AGCO, and the, that is outside of our jurisdiction to do any, to have anything to do with the liquor license. Now, as far as whether it, it impacts the decision to have a to have a patio or not, that is not included in the in the decision, like in the in the bylaw as, as criteria for issuing the permit. I think it can staff can give it weight in the event that you've had some some issues. But it is not specified in the bylaw as as criteria whether you you get a permit or not. It's more about the design, the construction, the uh, ability to to accommodate within the um, the regulations that we've set out. But the, the permit for the for the alcohol is separate and under uh, not under our jurisdiction. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, yes, uh, Councillor Wilton. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Might be for uh, Carrie. Uh, could it be criteria that they have to follow good business practices or something like that that kind of gives it an envelope of? We'd we'd have to actually um, open the bylaw and and look at it. The bylaw was um, prepared in consultation with Paul Dre, who does the prosecutions. Um, so it is, and it went through an extraordinary consultation process um, internally and and externally so I I just I caution opening opening that up for for something that we may or may not be able to regulate um, I think it's under the highway traffic act is is where it's actually regulated so I don't I don't know at this point but I mean we can we can certainly look at it but I would just hesitate opening that up right now it would be nice to to use this bylaw for a few more years and see where um, where there may be some short shortcomings with it. Sometimes once you use a bylaw and apply it, um, it then becomes obvious what, what works and what doesn't and what needs to be changed. I'd like to see a few more years under this bylaw to, um, to see where, where, there, where, if any, there are shortcomings. Any other? Yes, Councillor McDonald. Just one more. Oh, our bylaw officer left. Um, it was more about the bylaw um, yes, the liquor license is under the AGCO. Um, however, if the township received complaints that the bylaw officer had to look into, we would track those, correct? Does that make sense? Could you repeat the question again, Councillor McDonald? Yeah. Um, if, if there were complaints about the bylaw or say you had noise complaints or whatever complaint about a patio or or whatever you would be tracking those and so if someone called the township you would be tracking those and the permit is a type of licensing and you would take the committee would take into consideration those complaints yes that's correct and I'd okay. also like to point out that we do have short form wording that we were we had adopted last year that was a bit of a delay through the Ministry of Attorney General oh, okay getting. so now we do have Findable offenses um, for offense for any offenses under the patio bylaw. Um, now, our idea, our, our uh, approach is going to be educate, and then if if it's an ongoing issue, then proceed to issuing charges. Right. Um, but uh, we do have that now, so that it gives more teeth to the bylaw as well. Great, and so that was approved by the attorney general, correct? Yep. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, questions? Uh, I, I would just like to make a comment. I'm uh, looking forward to the long-term comp comprehensive uh, parking strategy. I think it's, uh, it's been sorely uh, missed and we need that for sure. Uh, I had a business for a long time on, uh, on the main drag here and uh, got to know a lot of the neighbors uh, and it just it is problematic uh, for those neighbors, not only here but also in Fergus. In terms of where they uh, where they can park, so it'll be. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think I'm really looking forward to this council sort of uh, finally sort of working with that and dealing with that, and hopefully we'll have something in place for 2024. 
Anyways, uh, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you, Dan, for your presentation. And I have a recommendation that the Council of Township of Centre Wellington approve the 2023 parking strategy outline and report CAO 202305, dated April 11th, 2023, and that the Managing Director of Corporate Services and Treasurer be authorized to sign a, a 2023 service agreement with Alpha Technology Systems, Inc. B, uh, uh, 2023 access and use agreement with the owner of the parking lot located at 739 St. Andrews Street, West Fergus. And uh, item C, 2023 service agreement for service uh, for use of a bus and taxi as a shuttle. Do we have a mover for that? Council Graddock, seconder for that. Council Wilton, all those in favor? So moved. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a, just a short uh, uh, bio break here. Uh, uh, six minutes.
Okay, we'll uh, get going again. Um, so we're on uh, item uh, 7.4, and um, uh, just a little bit of a change here, if Council uh, uh, will comply with me on this. Uh, we're going to get Adam to uh, provide his uh, overview uh, that way. And then we have uh, Delegation uh, Richard Wright, who's here. We'd like to speak to this. And uh, we'll have Richard come and uh, speak to it, and obviously uh, opportunities for comments and questions. And then we'll go into the recommendation. So, um, so let's um, let's start with uh, Adam. So. Welcome, Adam. Yes, thank you, Mayor Waters, and uh, through you to our members of council. Um, happy to be here just to provide a bit more context on this report today. So this is the annual speed limit traffic calming review and recommendations report. So in 2021, uh, Township Council endorsed a speed limit policy and technical approach for reviewing speed limits, assessing speeding concerns, and implementing effective speed reduction measures in urban and rural areas. Uh, part of this process includes reviewing posted speed limits and speeding concerns on an annual basis, preparing a speed limit and traffic calming review and recommendations report, and that's what this report is today. This is the second one that we've done. We did their first one last year. Uh, so uh, this is for the 2022 calendar year. A total of 58 road segments were evaluated uh, through this report, and these segments were selected based on uh, res uh, resident speed concerns reported through the Report It tool. Um, on the township's website, which we launched, launched last year and which we've been getting a lot of feedback through. Uh, speed limit reductions are recommended on 26 of the 58 assessed segments, and they include recommendations to lower speeds from 50 kilometers to 40 in the urban area and from 80 to 60 in the rural area. Uh, speeding has been confirmed on 20 of the segments, and more data is needed to confirm, confirm speeding on five of the segments. So to improve safety in confirmed speeding areas, a suite of uh, speed reduction measures were considered. Uh, they range um, from uh, the installation of flexible bollards to new speed limit signs where speed limits are recommended to be decreased, uh, the deployment of electronic speed signs, enhanced OPP enforcement, uh, and line markings to narrow travel lanes and provide buffers for uh, cyclists and pedestrians. And they are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. We look at the attributes of the road segment in question, and we try and make a recommendation that kind of fits that um, specific case. So uh, we're also recommending some speed reduction measures on, uh, in neighborhoods where 2023 construction activities on major collector roads are anticipated to result in increased ve vehicular traffic on local streets. Uh, the two key projects driving this need are the reconstruction of BD Line from St. Andrew to Millage uh, in Fergus and the reconstruction of East Mill Street from Metcalf to Melville and Alora. Uh, so as part of the 2023 budget process, uh, Council did approve $125,000 for the implementation of traffic calming measures for this year. And uh, after completing the review, uh, we think that an increase in this budget is uh, warranted to be able to implement all of the measures we are recommending. And so uh, staff are recommending increasing this budget from $125,000 to $250,000, um, uh, which would be uh, in effect for this year's budget. Uh, so that's everything I have on that report, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Yes, Council comments, questions. Councillor McDonald. Through you, Mayor Waters, um, I'm always happy to see speed reduction because, yes, I get those um, letters and I send them to the report it, which is excellent communications. Um, so the increase in funds, is that the sign cost mostly? Yes, yeah, so thanks, Councillor McDonald, for the question yeah. through you, Mayor Waters. So it's a bit of a, uh, a mixed bag. Uh, we've got um, more okay. uh, electronic speed display signs that we would like to purchase. Oh, okay. um, it's also, yes, the cost of, of, of um, changing out the traditional speed signs yeah. and uh, installing new speed signs. Um, some additional line painting, uh, purchases of flexible bollards, as I mentioned. Wow. Um, so it's, yeah, it's kind of the suite of different um, uh, measures that we're recommending to be able to purchase uh, that, those supplies and the labor for some of the installations. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Walton. Thank you, through, uh, Mayor Waters. Uh, just point of clarification 
kind of for you and also maybe for Dan, but we did discuss this uh, doubling this budget line item at the budget meeting um, back in January, I think that was. So I'm happy to see it come forward in the staff report because it was discussed and we had a delegation from the community about that at the time. So I think this is really just a continuation of that discussion that happened at the budget meeting. So I just wanted to clarify. That. Uh, through Mayor Waters, that's correct. It, it came up during budget meetings as something to consider and, and infrastructure staff considered it as part of their, their review. Yep. Any other comments, questions from Council? Yes, Council McDonald. This is more of a comment through you, Mayor Waters. Um, we recently had flooded in Ward 1 a bunch of 40 kilometer signs, and um, I do see a bit of a difference, and um, I'm happy to see them for sure. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from? Uh, Council. Okay. At this, yes. Sorry. Go ahead, Councilor Wilton. Thank you. Just one question on the methodology. I was kind of curious in some places where the TAC said to reduce it to 40, but your staff recommendation is to leave it at 50. And I was just curious if you could explain that a little bit more. Why that difference is. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Councillor Wilton, through the mayor. Good question. Um, so yes, in some cases, the TAC did recommend lowering from a 50 to a 40. In those cases, um, we, we're kind of, we, we, we're, we're using a reasoned argument to recommend um, a lowering uh, where it's warranted. The TAC is one tool. Um, another thing we do is we do a bit of a, a road test where we actually drive the road segments and we ask ourselves the question, does this feel safe to drive at the speed limit? Um, or can I, um, is it even, you know, is it possible to get to drive faster than the speed limit? Um, and uh, we also look at the 85th percentile uh, data. And so if we're seeing that, um, you know, it's tax recommending lo lower, we're looking at the 85th percentile, there doesn't appear to be an issue. Vehicles are traveling, you know, between 40 and 50 or maybe just slightly above 50. And we've also done the road test and we're saying, you know, um, in this, you know, a, a lot of cases it was uh, local streets and neighborhoods. And we're looking at it going, it, it would be very hard to, to get up to 50 and the 85th percentile speed would, stu would suggest the same. So to put up a 40 sign, wouldn't have much of a of an impact, we think, um, and uh, so yeah. In that case, we kind of reasoned that it would make sense to leave it as fifty. Any other comments, questions? Oh, one more. Yes, go ahead. I'm curious now. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm just curious with the report it tool, which I think is great, and I keep directing people to fill it in as much as possible. Um, how does that work in terms of? the communication back to the public. So if we can start, I know it's fairly new, so if we start like year over year saying in 2022 we had X number of kind of comments come forward and we managed it this way and this is how we address them. If there's a communication kind of feedback loop to keep that going, is, is that already happening or uh, is there plans to expand on that even more? Yes, thanks for the question again uh, through the mayor. So um, we, so it's kind of understood that once it's reported, um, it is logged, and we will look at it, um, and then we will report back uh, on the outcome through this report. Now that said, um, in some circumstances where we're, we're still getting emails from folks, perhaps we're not just ignoring those; we are uh, responding to them, and in some cases providing updates. Um, in advance of bringing forward the report. Um, and so, there, yeah, there have been some cases where we have been doing that. But for the most part, we're finding that it seems to be working fairly well where, you know, uh, everything's getting logged and reported. It's going into a database. And, you know, any, any concern that we receive, uh, we are looking at through this process. Any other comments, questions from Council? Okay. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite, uh, thank you, Adam. At this time, I'd like to invite Richard uh, Wright up to uh, speak to this. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council. My name is Richard Wright, and I live at 6823, the second line, West Garfraxa. And I have concern about uh, the extent of the road speed recommendations on the second line. I am not a speed demon. I am a survivor of a fatal road accident in 1971 <clears throat> in which the OPP charged the other driver. 
have not had any type of traffic ticket in almost 60 years of driving of about 35,000 kilometers a year, so I'm not staying home. And I have a Class A truck driver's license for a large farming operation. We travel these roads extensively to operate our farming operation up and down the first line, the second line, County Road 16, and right up into West Luther. <clears throat> I have many hats in my life. I like numbers. Consequently, I have worked for a large chartered accounting firm for almost 40 years and also the chair of the board of an insurance company which underwrites auto insurance. I like to be data driven and data validated. My pro comments primarily relate to the second line <clears throat> of West Garfraxa, which I drive almost every day. I would also like to thank Adam Gilmore for providing information and assisting in some of our past bridge concerns. I support the recommendation to install a four-way stop at the intersection of the second line and side road 20 because of the frequency of low speed fender benders due to poor visibility. It's not speed, it's visibility. I would also suggest intersection improvements by raising the road to the north and the east to level the intersection since a new stop sign at the north will make winter, dress, winter starting difficult since the road just falls away from the intersection. I've had eight years road building experience many years ago, having worked on the Conestoga Parkway, Hanlon Expressway, Wellington County Road 7 when it was first rebuilt in 1968, among many others around Ontario. The trees also need to be cut back off township property on the east side of this intersection. There's been an issue with the property owner and uh, that has to be cut back. <coughs> I accept the readings of the 85% percentile at 97K on the second line, but the question is what is the appropriate action and what changes will result? I have lived on the second line for 48 years and can only recall two incidents not being a low speed fender bender at one of the intersections. Both were minor single vehicle accidents where one was impaired and the other it was about two years ago where a van just drove off a ditch one morning there was no serious injuries, and they never made it into the papers. There are also very few bicycles on this road. It's pretty obvious with this hard data history of almost 50 years, this road is relatively safe, and the report says it feels safe. So the question is, why are we reducing the speed? From our driveway, I can see one mile to the north, and a mile and a half to the south. Not once in almost 50 years have I ever seen OPP radar enforcement. How can one ever expect speed limit compliance at any limit? Where would the 85 percentile experience be with adequate enforcement at 80K? I'm sure it would be down under the threshold for rural speeding, which is the 15 percent above. confirmation with Adam here again today. The speed observation was done in May of 22. Um, in in or 2022, the county had the bridge closed on County Road 16. We had all that traffic diverting across side road 20 and down the second line. Heavy trucks, there was a Honda Civic Gray that probably liked to do 125 consistently. There was never any OPP um, surveillance of that road during that period of time. Since the bridge has reopened, traffic has calmed. And I would bet somebody a cup of coffee if you took that observation again, we'd be down under the speed limit for uh, determining race, uh, not racing, sorry, speeding. <laughs> There's lots of traffic data out there indicating anticipated outcomes of speed reduction strategies, say from 80 to 70 or 80 to, to 60. Nowhere in this report is there any indications of anticipated outcomes. So why are you doing something and you have no data? When the council approves a tender for a truck or a bridge, you get a truck or a bridge. If you approve this recommendation, a recommended large expenditure of $250,000, what are you getting? 
particularly without any enforcement. And enforcement will always be short term, mainly for one or two months. Then they go away, we've got more things to do. There are countless videos on the internet about transient speed enforcement. Just go look at them. People get frustrated, police are there for a couple of months, and the signs go down and they're gone. I tried to access the Transportation Association of Canada guideline tools online, but they want $200 to even look at them, so that didn't go down that road, <coughs> to indicate what success there might be for various strategies. So there's nothing like that in this report. One item that doesn't help speed compliance is the lack of speed signs in this township. If there appears to be a problem, why aren't 80 key speed signs put up? and provide some enforcement. Woolwich Township has 80K and 70K speed signs on township roads in some of the areas to remind people of the limit. This report also doesn't deal with probably the worst road in the township being the second line from Bellwood Road to the Orangeville Road. If you're driving 80K, someone wants to pass you. I don't experience that on the second line above the Bellwood Road. Okay. The, uh, the, uh, the road from Bellwood to Orangeville Road, it has narrow shoulders, and the pavement is cupped so badly, making it very difficult to clear snow, resulting in a constant stream of cars surfing into the ditch during winter storms. And my son did snow plowing for the township for a couple of years at night, night shift. He found out a terrible road plowed that you, just, you couldn't scrape it clean, okay? Yet that road is not even in this study. So I have questions about which roads you're picking, okay? There's also no speed, and this is probably one of the biggest takeaways you wanna to have today. There's also no speed reduction signs approaching the steep hill down the Grand River, where often fishermen are wandering across the road, which I consider from an insurance perspective, negligence. The township has a huge liability here because you approach that hill, there isn't any signs for a steep hill, there's no speed reductions, and I've seen a truck swamp itself into the swamp just on the other side of the bridge because it couldn't stop. It came over the hill too fast. It's a Floridale feed truck with a pup behind it. The 85% observation on the second line was only 2K over the threshold for rural speeding. The speed reduction to 60 is overkill for a road with 50 years of safe history and even a feel-good safe rating by township staff. <laughs> Would a 70K limit lower the 85% to just under 15? We don't know because the report doesn't address that. Why 260? I would suggest installing some 80K signs and get some enforcement applied and even installing some solar powered speed indicators for a year and see what the outcome is. Then you'll have some data. Because right now you're, you're uh, shooting arrows into the dark. I also like the speed indicator when you come into Acton on Highway 25, thanking you for driving within the limit. There's, there's the whole book on how do you nudge people. The last comment regards the report that featured on the township website. Talking to neighbors and whatnot, it certainly has the aura of being a snitch line. Why aren't postings made public? You can take the names off. Like a restaurant review. So that the community knows maybe there's some concerns circulating around. It's certainly a risk of freedom of information request when the information now is out of your control. So how are people to know what concerns are out there? And maybe there could be a, a more widespread contribution to solutions to this speeding issues in this, in this township. So my recommendation is on a second line, put some signs up, get some enforcement, because you're penalizing all the people that drive between 60 and 80 when it's still a safe road. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Richard. Um, Comments, questions from council? Okay, I don't see any here. So um, we have a recommendation that the council township of Central Wellington endorses recommendation outline and report number 1S2023 and 9. 
uh, related to proposed speed limit reductions on township roads to be implemented through the upcoming amendment to the township calls consolidated uh, speed bylaw and that council directs staff to proceed with uh, implementing speed reduction measures out as outlined in report number 1s 2023-09 uh, and that council uh, approves increasing the budget of the capital project 2023 042 traffic calming measures 2023 from 125,000 to 250,000. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Jefferson, uh, first, a seconder on that. Councillor Wilton, all those in favor? Oh, yes, did you want to? Thank you, Mayor Waters. Uh, just curious on in terms of how the public like the residents along those streets because I think uh, our delegation brought up a good point mm -hmm. How are the residents along on any of the streets where there's changes going to be notified or were they notified or would it have just been being aware of this report? That would have come forward. Maybe we could ask staff that to how, how that would happen. Yes. Thank you Thanks, Councillor Wilton, through the Mayor. So we haven't been um, providing advance notification of the new speed signs. Um, <clears throat> typically, we have locators out there uh, in advance of installing them. People see the locators, and we start getting some calls, perhaps, saying, what are you doing on my road wire? Why is the, the paint showing up? Um, and at that time, we would explain. Um, so, yeah, that, that we've been using this report as kind of the send out of information. That said, in a circumstance uh, like this, uh, in consideration of Mr. Wright's delegation on the second line, we could certainly, um, you know, we could, we could provide some letters to residents notifying them of the, of the change. Uh, Councillor McDonald. Through you, Mayor Waters, just in light of our delegation today, um, is there a possibility to do some more follow-up on that one? Um, I'm just highlighting, you know, the the data part, um, maybe some black cats for a while, because if it was traffic because the bridge was closed, and I know the bridge was closed for a long time because uh, I went that way as well, um, then that will definitely impact results if we took them now. So. Um, I don't know how we would go about that, but I will leave that with you. Um, yeah. Okay, Councillor Welton and then Councillor Jefferson. Yeah, since we're talking about second line, I'm just curious because I have received some uh, correspondence from residents about um, at, at side road 15 as well, that there's that intersection has poor visibility. So would that be included in this study to put more of a four-way stop there or so improve the visibility at 15 as well? Thanks, Councillor Bolton, through the Mayor. So we looked at the intersection of Side Road 20 specifically because currently there is a two-way stop at that intersection. And when you look at the traffic volumes, the two-way stop is kind of positioned the wrong way. There's actually more traffic going east-west where the stop signs are versus north-south. So you would expect you would typically want the higher the the the, the segment with the higher average traffic to not stop, to, to, for them to have the, 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 the right of way and then for the, 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 the less traveled road to stop. So it's kind of the opposite of the way it should be currently. So um, looking at the warrants at that intersection, it makes sense for it to, to, to convert it to a four-way stop. Um, the, we haven't looked at the warrants at side road 20. That's something we can certainly look at. But yeah, we, we or, sorry, at 15, sorry, I'm talking about 20. Uh, we could look at, the, uh, uh, look at the warrants at side road 15 and see if, um, if that would make sense at that location, if, if we think it would make it safer. Councillor Jefferson. Oh, I was just going to follow up with Lisa. So once these get in, put into place, does staff follow up on the changes, like to see how the changes have happened or if it's improved conditions or... Yeah, thanks, Councillor Jefferson, through the mayor. So this is a continuous process. So we're making the recommendations, but we're also following up on the segments where we have implemented uh, speed reduction measures to see what the impact is. Because to Mr. Wright's point, he's, and he's absolutely correct, we're doing these things and we're not, we don't necessarily know what the impact is going to be. We're, 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 we, we think that they're going to have an impact, but we, we need to confirm that. So part of this, the, the, the process that we, um, that we brought forward to Council in 2021 
was to close the loop on it, to actually implement measures, but to still be going back to these segments and collecting data and to be doing that over time because we recognize also there are changes that impact traffic. Um, over time development, uh, changes to you know other, other roads being constructed. So this is very much a, a continuous process and we are trying to gather data to see, uh, to, to confirm or, um, you know, or, or uh, um, you know, or if something's not working, right, to give us an indication it's not working. We need to do something differently. So that is part of the process. Okay, we, uh, are we we're done, right? <laughs> Good. Okay, we had a mover and a second here. All those in favor? So moved. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go into item 7.5, request for tender uh, 0623. We have uh, Dan's going to return back to the mic here. Thank you again, Dan. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Um, so this is request for tender 0623, construction of BD line. Um, I will pass the floor off to Colin to go to do a technical review of the, of the scope of work and then I will discuss procurement after that. All right, thanks Dan and through Mayor Waters. So just uh, as, as a reminder, uh, the scope of this project, uh, this is a, a full reconstruction uh, of BD line. Uh, essentially, uh, we've, we have the, the, the area from St. Andrews uh, up to about uh, 200 meters north of, of Collie Court. Uh, so almost to side road um, 19 and uh, but the main portion of the reconstruction is going to be basically from Hill Street uh, up to um, kind of where we left off north of Colburn Street and so some of the features of the project uh, uh, is the multi-use path so we have uh, plans to construct a uh, three meter wide asphalt multi-use path uh, that'll go right from the entrance to Story Brook at Millage Lane or Elliott Street and uh, connect right down to the uh, um, uh, the Allure Cataract Trailway and the uh, the parking lot there. Um, we'll be adding storm sewers uh, as well as uh, curb and gutter. Uh, in terms of uh, traffic calming, uh, there's going to be um, uh, slightly narrower lanes. We've got 3.5 meter lanes with some center medians. Um, there's also going to be a new roundabout uh, constructed at uh, Colburn and BD line that uh, will also uh, function to slow traffic down as they uh, travel through that corridor. Um, and then the section uh, north of Colburn, um, we do have plans to implement uh, some traffic calming there. So, uh, so some uh, kind of uh, regularly spaced center medians are gonna be located through there uh, in additional line painting. Again, with the, uh, the idea to slow traffic down through there. Um, uh, also, uh, street lights will be added in. Uh, we've been working with uh, Hydro One to relocate uh, the hydro poles in that area, so we uh, are getting that lined up. Uh, there'll be street lights kind of hanging off of the, the hydro poles um, and uh, having a properly uh, lit street. Uh, also, some landscaping too. The roundabout will have, uh, there's a, a fairly detailed landscape plan for the roundabout. Um, and then uh, we'll be doing separate streetscaping of that section uh, at, a, at a later time. So, uh, so yeah, uh, this is uh, also, just want to mention too, this is subject to our early payment agreement uh, with Sorbera. So uh, Sorbera has front-ended um, uh, a large portion of the growth-related costs of this project. Uh, $3.9 million is a developer contribution. Uh, to this project. So um, just wanted to make uh, note of that. And also uh, in the financial analysis, you'll, you'll also note that uh, we're ex uh, providing services to a, uh, a future development site, um, uh, 4610 BD Line, uh, which is just kind of around where Hill Street intersects BD Line. Uh, we have uh, an agreement with the developer of those lands. Uh, they're doing um, they're in for site plan approval and they're uh, uh, looking to get those lands serviced, so extending uh, sanitary sewer and water main uh, to the lot. So that's part of this, uh, this construction as well. So. Great, thanks Colin. Um, the request for tender was advertised and we had 37 registered plan takers, nine firms submitted. Um, bids were checked by our consulting engineer, Triton Engineering. Uh, no errors were found. Um, and we support tender award to Cox Construction Limited at a contract price of $4,606,609.10, including contingency but excluding HST. 
the financial analysis is shown in attachment A. Um, the great news here is we're approximately 877,000 under budget. Um, there are some funding reallocations required here. Um, you'll see from attachment A, it's a fairly complicated financial exercise, uh, but there are development charges, um, OSIF grant funding and water capital reserve funding being reallocated from one project to another. Um, and there are a few minor additional funding requirements here, uh, roughly 34,000 required from the general capital reserve to fund part of the project and about $130 required from the wastewater capital reserve. So very minor considering the, the significant value of the project. Um, and I would like to note that there is a county contribution of $580,000 on the, on the project, which relates to the impacts of that area from the, the county campus. Um, that's everything. Happy to answer any questions on, on the report. Uh, thanks, Dan and Colin. Uh, comments, questions from Council? Okay. <laughs> We, have a, we have a recommendation that the Council of Township of Centre Wellington award request for tender uh, 0623 regarding reconstruction of BD Line to Cox Construction Limited at a contract price of four million six hundred and six thousand six hundred six hundred and so sorry four million six hundred it's a big number uh, four million six hundred and six um, six zero nine and ten dollars including contingency and excluding HST. Uh, do we have a mover for that? Councillor McDonald, seconder. Councillor Jefferson, all those in favor? So moved. Uh, moving on to, uh, thank you. Uh, moving on to item 7.6, uh, request for tender. We have Dan here again. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Um, to start things off, this is request for tender 12 23, Center Wellington Business Park Phase 2. And I'll ask Colin to do another technical review of this one. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dan. And through Mayor Waters. So, uh, so this is Phase 2 of the Business Park uh, servicing. Phase 1 was completed at the end of last year uh, with the Earthworks program. Uh, this, this year's work uh, will involve uh, servicing the business park and extending. Uh, Dixon Drive uh, further to the east into the business park lands to first line. Also constructing uh, the new cul-de-sac that uh, kind of extends south off of uh, future Dixon Drive. Uh, so construction of water main, uh, sanitary sewers, and, uh, and the stormwater management system. Uh, this will be a, a full urban section, so with uh, curb and gutter and storm sewers. And, uh, and we're also constructing the multi-use path uh, within the business park too. So there'll be a, a connection uh, kind of to the north at, at uh, Glengarry um, uh, or with the future potential to extend to Glengarry uh, Crescent, um, but it'll essentially connect down to the Allure Cataract Trail. So we'll have a, a, a multi-use path connection to, from the business park uh, in that area to the, to the trail itself. So um, that's all included in this contract. Uh, in, in a future year, we will we'll have uh, surface asphalt um, as well as the, the paving for the multi-use path in a, in a future year contract, uh, paving contract. So we'll complete uh, the road to base asphalt. Uh, the trail will be completed to um, uh, kind of base granular, granular A material for, for now. So. Great, thank you, Colin. Um, we did have uh, 37 registered plan takers. Uh, 12 submitted responses, the, which might be a record for us. I don't remember ever receiving 12 responses on a bid. Uh, bids were checked for errors and omissions by Triton Engineering. There was one error noted in one of the bids. Um, we recommend award to Erzman Construction Inc. at a contract price of $2,109,862.49, including contingency and excluding HST. Uh, the financial analysis is in attachment A. Uh, we are significantly under budget, which is great news. Um, from a funding perspective, just note that this entire project is funded from the Economic Development Reserve Fund. Um, it'll initially drive the reserve into a negative balance as we're servicing the land, but then uh, proceeds from lot sales will go into the reserve and drive it back up into um, a fairly significant positive balance. Um, so it's just a temporary financing uh, through, through the reserve fund. So happy to take any questions. 
Uh, thanks, Dan and Colin. Uh, questions, comments from Council? Yes, Councillor Wilton. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Uh, question for Colin. I noticed this includes street lighting, is that correct? Yes. And <laughs> so a question on that, just because due to previous Council's decision, this is kind of intruding into the rural area. So I'm curious about the lighting, because I know we did some creative lighting, innovative lighting on Tom Street, where it's a little more, uh, it's dimmed more often than it. It only gets triggered when somebody walks by or drives by or bikes by. So I'm just curious about the street lighting in terms of not creating a whole pool of light pollution out on first line and uh, what we can maybe do about that. For sure. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question and, and through Mayor Waters. Uh, so, so yeah, so this will be, uh, um, yeah, like we'll have street lights on, on the road. Uh, we will, um, again, be using, it'll be overhead hydro. This is now a, a Center Wellington Hydro service area. Um, and uh, so we'll be attaching the street lights there. We do have, uh, there is the technology exists to, um, to dim street lights. So you can set uh, a certain time uh, of the, uh, at night where, um, uh, where they're, they're only brightened when there's activity on the street. Uh, so, so that's something we can look at. It's not, it hasn't been a standard practice. There's been uh, admittedly some hiccups with that technology <laughs> uh, after implementation, but I think it's, it's something we can certainly revisit uh, in this case. There's a bit of energy savings um, as a result, and, uh, and of course less, less light pollution uh, with the ability to typically dim it like kind of 30, 40 percent uh, brightness. So that's something we can look into for sure. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. And I've mentioned this before, but the, uh, if we're connecting that multi-purpose path to the lower cataract trail, if there could be a consideration for future years to put a crosswalk or a, some kind of safety uh, measures at, the, at that crossing. For sure, so yeah. So getting more activity. Yeah, for sure, yeah, through, through Mayor Waters. So uh, we'll, we'll look at the, at the signage. Uh, there's a bit of a curve there as well, vertical curve on the road. Um, so the crossing of the, of the trail at first line um, and just make sure we've assigned, signed that appropriately and uh, in, a, in accordance with the Ontario Traffic Manual. That's, that's kind of our, our guidebook for, for trail crossing signage. So uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that location as well. Okay. A, yes, Councillor Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can you refresh my memory on when we're going to start selling the lots in the business park? Yes, thank you, uh, through Mayor Waters. Um, we wanted to have the servicing contract awarded and, and underway before we started doing any, any selling, so we can start initiating that process once, once we get going on, on the servicing. Okay, so then is it okay that the Economic Development Reserve Fund, uh, with George, is that okay that that's going to be in a negative for a little while? That's yeah, through through Mayor Waters, that that was what we planned. It, it's basically borrowing from other reserves for a short period of time, um, and interest will be charged between between the areas um, until we start selling selling lots. So we're we're good with that from a funding perspective. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, thank you, Dan and Colin. Uh, we have a recommendation the Council of Township of Centre Wellington award request for tender 1223 regarding construction of Centre Wellington Business Park Phase 2. The Tourisman Construction Incorporated a contract price of 200,000 or 2,109,862.49 cents, including contingency and excluding HST. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Jefferson, seconder. Councillor Craddock, all those in favor? So moved. Uh, item 7.7, .7, request for tender 0723. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Uh, this is a uh, request for tender 0723 for sport utility vehicles, pickup trucks, and electronic passenger vehicle. Um, we are recommending award of two sport utility vehicles five half-ton pickup trucks and one electric vehicle. Um, through the tender, we did um, initially request both 2023 and 2024 trucks um, as, as approved through the budget process. Um, Council will recall we um, recommended moving forward with two years at a time given delays in production and delivery. Uh, but we're finding now that the production and delivery delays are somewhat mitigated. So we've scaled back for this tender anyway, and we're only going to be awarding the vehicles approved for 2023. 
Um, attachment B has the financial analysis. We did have five registered plan takers and that is outlined in attachment A. Um, overall, we're roughly 52,200 over budget and you can see from attachment B that that's from a variety of, of funding sources and we are finding that there are um, pricing pressures when it comes to items like, like trucks and, and utility vehicles. Um, so this is just an indication that that price volatility is still happening. Uh, we are recommending award with the net shortfall being funded through the funding areas identified in attachment C. Sorry, attachment, yeah, attachment C is, is, the, is the summary of, of the overages by area. And I would like to point out that um, attachment D to the report shows a new branding concept for, for the vehicles and the SUVs. Uh, we are working on an overall branding strategy, um, but we thought uh, moving forward with, with the vehicles this year to show what our, our township branded vehicles will look like would be of, of interest to Council. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dan, for that report. Comments, questions from Council? Uh, seeing none, uh, we have a recommendation that the Council of Township of Centre Wellington authorize the award of request for tender 0723 sports utility vehicles, pickup trucks, and electric passenger vehicles, including optional equipment and excluding HST, as follows. A, two sport vehicle, uh, sport utility vehicles as a total price of $72,082. Uh, um, from Weingard Motors, Item B, five half-ton uh, pickup trucks at a total price of two hundred eighty thousand ninety-four seventy-five from Barry Cullen uh, Chevrolet Cadillac Limited. Item C, one electric vehicle at the total price of thirty-eight thousand three hundred twenty-six seventy-two from Barry Cullen uh, Chevrolet uh, Cadillac Limited, and that the funding for the outfitting and procurement be revised as outlined in report. Core 2023 33, dated April 11th, 2023. Do we have a mover for that? Uh, Councillor McDonald, seconder. Councillor Wilton, all those in favour? So moved. We will dash our way to item 7.8 fees and charges amendments. Dan. Thank you, Mayor Waters. Uh, this is an amendment to the fees and charges bylaw that Council passed in January. Uh, there are three components to this amendment. The first one relates to planning fees, planning related fees, and other development related fees. Uh, you'll recall that we had a, a report and presentation by Watson and Associates uh, a few months ago relating to the planning fee area that outlined a need to both increase planning fees and to incre increase our planning staff complement uh, to address growth in, in Centre Wellington. Uh, this amendment to the various planning and development fees is as a result of the recommendations approved by Council in that report. Um, the second area, sorry, and that is in Schedules A, E and G to, to the bylaw. The second area is relating to Municipal Road Occupancy Permit fees and that is in Schedule G um, to, to the bylaw and there's, so there's a change in fee structure there. And lastly, there is a housekeeping item relating to cemetery fees and charges in Schedule C to the report. Um, wasn't going to go into too many more details there, but staff are happy to answer any technical questions on, on the amendments. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, comments, questions from Council concerning this report? Yes, Councillor MacDonald. Um, the fees to... Um, burial plots so that goes up the same as our budget went up 3.5 through you uh, Lisa just reminded me this correction is a rounding up error that was missed in the oh. first the first so there there are really no changes other than the a rounding up correction to correct it yeah any other comments questions from council Okay, uh, seeing none, we have a recommendation that the Council of Township of Central Wellington endorse an amendment to bylaw 2023-01, uh, the Township 2023 fees and char uh, charges bylaw pursuant to recommendation coming from report 
PLN 2023-07 regarding the planning and development uh, fee study and that council, the Township of Centre Wellington, endorsed various amendments to bylaw 2023-01 to facilitate further changes related to the municipal road occupancy permits and other housekeeping items. Do we have a mover for that? Councillor Jefferson, seconder, Councillor Wilton. All those in favour? So moved. Uh, we move down, thanks Dan. Uh, we move down to item uh, eight, information item, naming rights agreement template. A uh, report from Pat Newson. Uh, yeah, that was included on the agenda as an information item. Okay. And I'm um, happy to answer any questions. We're just trying to share what that agreement will look like so Council's understanding the steps that staff are taking to arrange these naming rights. Okay, any uh, comments, questions from uh, Council? Nope, okay. Uh, nothing to do with that. So then we move down to number nine, bylaws. Um, okay, so uh, 2023-28, a bylaw to amend schedules A, C, and E, and G to bylaw number 2023-01 being a bylaw to establish the fees and charges for various services provided by the municipality. 2023-29, a bylaw to authorize managing director of the corporate services and treasurer to execute a service agreement between the Corporation of the Township of Centre Wellington and Alpha Technology Systems Inc. So there's a recommendation that the bylaw 2023-28 and 2023-29 be read a first, second and third time and pass signed by the Mayor and Clerk and the corporate seal affixed. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Craddock, a seconder. Councillor MacDonald, all those in favour? Oh, thank you. Uh, any notice, item 10, any notice of motions? Nope. Uh, motions where notice have been given? Nope. Confirmation uh, bylaw. A bylaw to confirm the actions of council recommendation that the bylaw 2023-30 to confirm the proceedings of council at its meeting held April 11, 2023 be introduced a first, second, and third time and pass an open council. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Wilton, a seconder. Councillor Jefferson, all those in favour? So moved. And then, uh, uh, and do I have a mover to adjourn? Councillor McDonald, seconder. Councillor Jefferson. <laughs> yeah, you weren't fast enough. <laughs> Anyways, all those in favour? So moved. Thank you for your time and efforts and good questions today, Council, and uh, we'll see you next time.